Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, stand me up for a date multiple times? You'll regret that. A woman said she was interested in me. We went out twice, then I invited her to a Christmas concert. She agreed to come around five days before the concert, then stopped answering until the morning of the concert. I followed up with her twice to confirm whether she was going since she was being so quiet about it. All she answered that morning was yes. Concert time arrives and she was a no-show. Ended up excusing herself at 8.30pm. Concert was at 8. Her excuse was that she was too exhausted to go but posted an Instagram story later that night at a popular hangout spot. I decided to let it slide and we planned to hang out two weekends later. Another concert. The same thing happened. She agreed to go then stayed silent until the concert day, confirmed she will be going in the morning, then cancels 20 minutes before the concert. I ended up going with a neighbor to avoid going alone. I encounter her the following weekend at a hangout. She texts me if I'll be around. I respond. She stops replying. I see her one hour later with another guy. There was another concert recently and she had posted she wanted to go. I think she posted knowing I'd see it since I get free tickets for certain concerts. I invited her to the concert, then I canceled on her right before she was about to head to the stadium. Am I a jerk? Did I go too far? You canceled too soon, dude. She deserved to get all the way there, wait 30 minutes for you, just to find out you blocked her already. Please tell me you went anyways with someone else and posted pics of it. OP. I did, actually. We had a great time. Also, my excuse for canceling was that I was too exhausted. I found out that my mother is cheating on my father. My mom and dad are both 42 years old and they are married for 20 years. Well, my notebook broke and I had to do some research for school, so I asked my mom if I could use hers. She gave it to me and I went to do the research. While I was on the internet, a message appeared and I could read the phrase, Hi love. I opened it thinking it was my father's and what I read made me sick. The message is from one of my father's friends. The guy is married and I study with his daughter. So I looked at the history and it has messages from at least one year ago besides photos and videos. It was the worst thing that I've ever seen in my life. My father takes my mother on dates, treats her very well, helps with chores and everything. I don't understand how she has the courage to do that to him. Well, he's traveling and will only come back tomorrow. I copied everything, email, messages, pictures, videos, and I saved it to show him. I'm trying to hide my feelings but I can't look at her without feeling disgusted. What I want to know is, how do I do this? Should I show them both at the same time? Do I show him first and let him solve it? And my friend, her father is cheating too. Do I say something? Thanks. Stay out of your parents' marriage. This is none of your business. OP, when something affects me, it is my problem, and I will tell him no matter what you say. You are a product of your mom and dad's marriage. You don't know the full story. If you want an explanation, ask her. If you want to throw gasoline on a fire, talk to your dad. OP. Explanation for what? How she's been cheating on my dad for a year? For the horrible thing she said? No thank you. Update. Well, after I made this post, I got in touch with my older brother who's 24 and I told him everything. He was also shocked by all of this and said it was best for me to keep calm and that he would come over. He lives in another city. He arrived this afternoon and I showed him everything, but he was unable to see even half. He made a copy to keep safe and stayed at a friend's house so my mom didn't suspect anything. The other day, my dad came home from a trip and my brother and I took this opportunity while my mom was working to tell him. I said that I had found something in my mom's notebook and that I thought he didn't know, so I showed him. He started reading everything and after about five minutes, he started to feel sick and threw up. My brother is in medical school, so he managed to calm my father down, but he was in shock. We stayed there for an hour and started talking again. I asked him if he knew this or if they had some kind of agreement, and he said no. I had already imagined that. I asked him if I was right to show him this since it was none of my business, and he said yes, that I am part of the family and I did the right thing. I asked if I should tell my friend's mother, but he decided to call her and ask her to come here. She came with my friend and my father told her everything. She cried so much. She said she had a suspicion that he was cheating, but didn't know who it was with. She asked me how I found out, so I gave them their IDs, emails, and nicknames, and she went home to look. Later she came back, and it was the same thing. 
started about one year ago only that my mother was not the only one. He has more than one woman he's cheating with, but nobody knows her. He told my mother that she was the only woman for him. I asked my friend for forgiveness for not telling her, but she said that I had nothing to forgive, that she understands why I did it. The night my mother arrived, she was scared to see my brother at home. My father asked her, and initially she denied everything, but when he insisted, she started crying and told the truth. My mother kept crying, saying that it shouldn't have happened. My dad asked why, and she kept saying it wasn't supposed to be like this, that she didn't want to hurt him, that my father was the only man for her, but she ended up letting herself be carried away by emotion, that the other guy meant nothing, that she eventually would stop and tell the truth. Yeah, right. She was begging him not to make any hasty decisions and that she will do whatever it takes to show that he is the only man for her. During all of this, he didn't say a word. At the end, he took a suitcase, asked if we were going to stay. I said I would go with him, so the three of us went to my uncle's house who lives nearby. He cried all night. I told my brother that I wouldn't live with her even if my dad comes back, so he said I could live with him. This morning she called me to talk. I didn't want to, but my brother insisted. She said it was never the intention to hurt my father, that she will do everything to be a better wife and a mother. She asked how my father found out, and I said that I told him. She asked me how, but I didn't tell her. I said that I hope one day I can forgive her, but right now I can't. I said I don't want her on my birthday or even at my graduation party. She started crying again, so I left. Some of you say that I see the world in a way that doesn't exist, that not everything is perfect, that I just didn't know what my parents' relationship was like, and maybe you're right, that I'm just a naive girl who doesn't know how the world works. No matter what you do, you will always end up hurting yourself with a person who does not respect you, and that I'm stupid to think that there will be a person out there who will like me and never hurt me, who we can grow old together and love each other. I agree that I am stupid to think like that, but after yesterday, I also realized something, the damage the betrayal does, and I'd prefer to just be alone rather than be with someone who would treat me like that. So I'll just try to answer some common questions. Do I regret what I did? No. Will my father try to reconcile? I don't know, but I don't think so. He already talked to a lawyer about divorce. Here, betrayal counts in favor of my father in divorce. Why didn't I talk to my mom first? It didn't make sense to do that. First, she had a year to tell the truth. What difference would it make for me to tell her first? So she can confess? Again, what would be useful? It would be a forced, meaningless confession. Sometimes people have to take a slap of reality to wake up for life. Have I always been angry with my mom? No, until last Thursday, our relationship was perfect. How do I feel about destroying two families? Nothing, because I didn't destroy anything. They did it when they wanted to betray. But what if he mistreats her or doesn't meet her needs? It doesn't matter. If he mistreats you, you divorce him. But what about her needs? Okay, what about his? I'm sad that you chose to create a huge conflict in your family. When you grow up, you will learn that monogamy is a myth, not an enjoyable way of life. Shame on you for being such a shameless jerk. Karma is a jerk. One day when you're stuck in a dead-end marriage and one of your kids outs you for being an adulterer, you'll remember everything we were trying to tell you. You should have minded your own business. Some of these commenters on Reddit are just the most vile people I've ever heard of. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay my friend who paid for my wedding dress? I was looking to buy this dress from a brand in New York City. Because I'm not based there, the only option was to go through a retailer where I'm based at, and that would cost me $2.4,000, excluding alterations. I found a listing from Still White, and it was the exact dress I wanted in my size, and brand new. The previous owner had canceled her wedding for $900. My longtime friend from school, Serena, who happened to be in New York at the time, agreed to pick it up for me and bring it back with her to where I'm based, where she's also from. I was really grateful and happy, and I was even intending to give her a $100 tip on top of the Uber rides to and from the place. I said I would reimburse her as my token of appreciation. However, my joy turned to shock, horror, dismay, and disbelief when I saw Serena's Instagram story showcasing her trying on my wedding dress. I called her out for it, telling her I wasn't happy. She not only tried it on without my permission, but posted it for the public to see. She didn't take it down, even after a conversation we had about this. To make matters worse, she admitted she collected the dress posing as me. Through an email bill later, 
I noticed that the dress had also been altered on the spot, all without my knowledge or my consent. When confronted, Serena nonchalantly stated that it was her one chance to try a wedding gown and insisted I should get over it and reimburse her the $900 she paid for the wedding dress. My wedding dress experience was entirely hijacked. I'm now hesitant to pay her back. This all happened yesterday and she reached out today to ask for the money back and told me to get over it because she needs to make a big purchase tomorrow and it would help her cash flow. Since she wants it so bad, she can now have it. Am I the jerk? What kind of alterations can be done on the spot? OP, it was a waste alteration. For context, this bridal shop has a seamstress in-house and for dresses to be bought off the rack, they offer on-the-spot alterations, unless it's significant. In this case, it was the waste. Update. I know everyone must be wondering why I'm even friends with Serena and how that reflects on me as a person too. Serena and I go a long way back. I've always known Serena as a crappy friend, but I still kept her around because of her mental health struggles. I was the only friend connected to her family, so if anything, I would have been the one to sound the alarm. I don't think I could have lived with the guilt if anything really happened to Serena. But, well, I guess my job is done because Serena's audacity tells me she's in a much better place. Good for her. Moving forward, I don't have the dress on hand yet because it's still in New York with her. She's coming back to where we are based February 24th. I agree that she was doing me a favor, and for that, I think I will still pay her for the dress. After all, it is $900, but with the following terms. I will only pay her upon receipt of the dress. The trust is completely broken. I don't know what else she might have done to the dress. Sleep in it? I unfortunately need this leverage over her until I have it in my hands, or else she has no incentive to keep her hands off of it. For all I know, she chucked it in the dusty storage to spite me. 2. I will pay her the 900 minus the cost of dry cleaning and alterations. It's like borrowing a friend's clothing and not washing it before returning it. Did I mention she also tried it after her pilot's class without showering? I think this arrangement is fair and I would not owe her anything. And I will end this friendship. To be honest, I think if Serena and I met as adults, we wouldn't be friends. The friendship has run its course and I think I did the best I could with it. Update 2. Serena had actually told me that there were lipstick stains on the dress and offered to buy a stain pen. Later I found out from the shop owner that the stains were actually caused by Serena. So Serena not only lied blatantly, but tried to cover up her vile behavior by coming across as helpful. I have since reverted to Serena and gave Serena two options. One, sell it to me at half the cost to cover alterations and dry cleaning, or two, sell it to someone else. She chose option two and showed no true remorse. End of story and friendship. I, 29 female, have been with my husband who's 29 male for eight years. I have feelings for a coworker, 30 male, that I can't shake. I've been with my wonderful husband since we were 20 and 21. We have an amazing relationship with each other, still make time for dates every week and really just enjoy each other. He became my best friend instantly from when we started hanging out in high school and that still hasn't changed today. I have a girlfriend who I do call my best friend and outside of my marriage, she is, but even that doesn't compare to the friendship I have with my husband. We've had our rough patches, but never anything very severe. There are some things I need to change about myself and things he needs to work on as well. Nothing relationship ending, just things that we need to do better and be better people and better partners, and I doubt this will ever change as it's impossible to just be perfect people. We don't have any kids, nor are kids in our future. We both work and bring home pretty decent money, although we've both had small patches of unemployment in the past and were supported by the other. There's never been any hostility over the finances, regardless of who's making more or who is supporting whom. Our marriage has survived depression, alcoholism, and a couple of physical medical conditions, all met with overwhelming support from each other. We're a great team. Our love life is great and very active. A dry spell for us is going to the work week without hooking up because one or both of us are just too exhausted, but that is not very common. We get along well with each other's families, and my family is really bonded with my husband, as far as they're concerned, he's just another son or brother. He's everything I could have ever hoped for in a husband and more, and I really truly love him. Now, I felt myself attracted to others in the past, and I'm sure he has been through the same, but it's not anything we've ever discussed with each other. I know that it's normal, and it's never been anything too intense before. If I find myself starting to get feelings for someone who I see a lot, it doesn't take much to shake it off, 
This is the first time I've ever dealt with feelings so intense, and I don't really know what to do next. My coworker is very attractive, super friendly, and I just enjoy being around him. We started working at this company around the same time, roughly eight months ago. We were in training together for a couple of weeks, which was absolute torture. My feelings came on strong and came on quick. I'm sure I've turned red when he flashes me a smile. It would be embarrassing enough if I were single simply because we work together. But I'm married, and I feel that probably looks really poorly on me. We don't work together anymore, but our departments are close, and if he walks through my section, he'll put his hand on my shoulder and give it a squeeze to get my attention when he's walking by, then flash me that smile. I'll make conversation if we pass each other or at a work event together, but I do the same with pretty much everyone I've worked with and currently work with. We don't have each other on social media, haven't exchanged numbers, and we don't see each other outside of work. I was invited out to a bar nearby by him and a few others a couple of times, but turned them down. I work in a male-dominated field and didn't feel right being the only woman out at the bar with a bunch of guys, especially one who I do feel this way about. I avoid his floor at work when possible, and if he's on lunch at the same time, I'll just say hi as I pass, but just grab my stuff and eat on the patio or another floor. I try to just avoid thinking about him or remind myself of how dumb I'm being, but I can't shake this feeling. I'm not afraid I'm going to be an idiot and let passion take over or any of that nonsense, and I think all of those excuses for one-time mistakes are garbage. I'm in control of my actions and could never be so cruel to my husband. I just don't know what to do to shake these feelings. The last time I felt such a strong desire for someone was when I met my husband. We were really great friends instantly and hung out and fooled around for about a year before we made things serious. I was very young when we got together and none of my relationships prior were very serious. I just never felt so strongly attracted to someone and didn't think it was even possible to with anyone else. I don't compare my husband to my coworker and vice versa and that's not what I'm trying to do here either. I've just been able to shake it off every time that I've had feelings come on for someone else. It doesn't matter what I do with this guy though. If I think about him, it's hard to get him off my mind regardless of what's going on around me. I've gone weeks without running into him and he won't cross my mind, but then I catch a glimpse of him when I'm strolling into work and my heart will start racing faster. I have a desire to be around him and be close to him and I just need it to go away. I feel like I'm in high school all over again, except instead of daydreaming in class, I'm trying to get this dude off my mind and get some work done. I know that Reddit is big on full disclosure, but this is not something I will be discussing with my husband. These feelings aren't coming out of neglect or want in my relationship with him. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything by being with him and there's nothing that he can do that would fix this for me. If he were feeling the same way about someone, I can honestly say I wouldn't want to hear about it. If he felt neglected and like my actions were causing him to desire affection elsewhere, then that would be a different story. I know that this is something that would affect him really bad and I don't want him to feel uncomfortable for the 40 to 50 hours a week that I'm in the same building with this guy when there's nothing he could do or say that would change what's going on with me and there's no chance of me crossing a line. I just don't see the purpose in creating an issue in my marriage when there isn't one. Update. I'm friends with my husband's boss's wife and gave her a call to help get his time off. His employer is very lenient on time off and I just set it up so that they were expecting him to call out. We had a romantic extended weekend away and it gave me a chance to really appreciate him. Thank you to the Redditors who advised putting more focus on us. I don't think I would have planned the surprise otherwise. Now back to work. A lot has happened in the last month and I'm planning on going no contact with the coworker the very second that I can. Shortly after I returned, I found out that he had put in for a transfer into my department and had also been added onto my team. No problem, I'm an adult. I can behave like an adult and the time away to clear my head and reevaluate where I was putting my energy had had a bigger effect than I anticipated. Well, things got a little weird. He started grabbing me coffee when he'd pick up his because I took on a new project and was showing up earlier and staying later than normal, but didn't do this for anyone else whose workload had increased. About four of us took on new clients. Our lunches lined up a little more frequently. I got friend slash follow requests on social media, declined, stuff like that. I felt like he would stand a little closer to me than what was comfortable, but at this point still felt like I was reading too much into it. It was confusing and difficult given that this feeling isn't wanted, but I do just feel drawn to him like there's a connection I desperately want to break. I always park by the smoking section because I have a filthy habit and I like to be close, and he caught me tonight while I was walking out to my car. He stopped me and asked to bum a smoke, and we talked for a couple of minutes. 
He then said he had something kind of uncomfortable to talk to me about. He told me he had felt really attracted to me since we first met and that working more closely with me had shown him that he has some real feelings for me. He says he knows that I'm married and will respect any boundaries I set up, but that he hasn't felt as strongly about someone before and he couldn't live with the what ifs. Apparently, he went so far as to end things with his girlfriend and is now staying with his parents for a couple of weeks while he gets a new place lined up. He said he could feel something between us and didn't think it was only him. I told him that I am very happily married and that he shouldn't mistake my friendliness with flirtation and that he needs to learn more appropriate boundaries with coworkers. I asked him to give me distance and that if it wasn't work-related, there was no reason to discuss it because we are coworkers, not friends, and left. He looked a little defeated and apologized for overstepping. My husband is out of town on a work trip, so I had come home to an empty house feeling the weirdest mix of emotions I've had since this whole thing started. The way he came across letting me know he was okay if I cheated on my husband with him painted him in a whole new light. He doesn't seem like this charming guy anymore, just a jerk who probably hasn't been told no enough times in his life. I have trouble falling asleep by myself and this whole situation has been a mess, so sorry for any weird formatting. I'm exhausted and figured I may as well update while everything is fresh. I'm confused. I still think he's really attractive, but I'm not equally repulsed by him as a person overall. To those who missed my comments addressing it, my husband will be given full details of our encounters when he gets home. I don't want him getting worked up while he's so far away. I won't be telling him about my feelings towards coworker because they are irrelevant to the situation that is now progressing. Anyways, mini update. I didn't go into work today, but I did get an email from coworker. It starts with what seems like a sincere apology to then offering to buy me dinner this weekend to make it up to me. I responded with, your advances made me very uncomfortable and I will say again that I'm not interested in setting anything up outside of work. His second email was another apology while making sure I knew the offer for dinner as friends to make it up to me would still be on the table. I did not respond to the second one and he has not reached out again today. I'm in a weird place growing a bigger dislike towards coworker while still having those weird primal feelings. Planning a nice dinner in and some Netflix and chill when my husband gets home. Definitely putting in for a department change when one becomes available. I've spent a little time browsing job postings, but I do love where I work, so I don't think that's the best solution. Am I the jerk for telling my stepdaughter that she has to start cooking all the meals when she visits? I have a 19-year-old stepdaughter, Molly. She attends college two and a half hours away from us and visits a few times a month for two to three days at a time. For the most part, she's pretty good, and I do love her and enjoy planning activities and outings when she's here. For the past six months or so, Molly has become extremely picky about the food my husband or I cook, but not any other food. She will try a dish, take one bite, and if she doesn't like it, throw it in the trash. I mean, throw the entire dish in the trash, not just the bite that she took. For example, I'll make a homemade lasagna that she's had many times before, she takes a bite, decides it's not to her liking, and immediately tosses the entire pan into the garbage. This always happens when either myself or my husband are in the kitchen with her. We've both asked Molly why does she throw the food out, and it's always the same response. It wasn't any good, and she can't eat it. We've asked her to please stop throwing away entire dishes, because we will eat them, and she says she doesn't want to even look at it anymore. As far as we know, Molly only does this with us. I finally told Molly and my husband... He agreed with me, the next time she tosses a dish either of us has made, she will assume full cooking responsibilities when she's here. That way, whatever is made will be to her liking. It happened again, and I stuck by what I had said. Molly got upset and went to her mom's, 30 minutes away, because her time with us, or her mom, is supposed to be fun and relaxing, not having to do chores. Molly's mom called my husband in a rage, screaming how we are treating Molly as unfair, She's a kid, and it's not hard to just fix a different meal to make her happy, and accusing us of emotional and mental mistreatment. Molly's mom does not cook, so they either go out or order food for all of their meals. Molly is currently refusing to visit unless I apologize to her and agree that she can do what she wants with the food. My husband misses his daughter, but he's siding with me on this, saying Molly has been wasteful and disrespectful of our cooking and hospitality. We never cook anything we know she dislikes, when she's here, we tend to make dishes that she's always enjoyed before and ask for her input and suggestions, but she says she doesn't care what we make. I feel bad because I know this is hurting my husband and I do miss Molly. Plus, I want her to spend time with us and have a good time here. Am I the jerk? There's something deeper at play here. I'm not sure what, but it's something. 
I'm not coming back unless you apologize to me and tell me I'm allowed to do whatever I want? Um, absolutely not. No kid will be dictating terms for me in my own home. There is precisely zero acceptable reason to throw out an entire dish just because you've decided you're too good for it. I get the sense that this is mom's doing somehow. With the no cooking, all the takeout, etc., it seems like something regarding her influence is making Molly behave this way, and I wouldn't stand for it either. Mom's reaction and accusations affirm this theory for me. I get that you and your husband both miss Molly, but agreeing to her demands would do nothing but enforce that she runs things in you and your husband's house, and that's not acceptable. Personally, I would have no problem telling her as much. Obviously, you're not the jerk. Am I the jerk for breaking up with my girlfriend because she's still friends with the guy she cheated with in her previous relationship? Me, 26, and my ex-girlfriend, 25, were together for about a year. Some weeks ago, we were hanging out with some of her friends, not the friend in question. We were playing a little quiz game, and one of the questions that popped up involved cheating. I mentioned that I hate cheaters, and after that, I noticed one of the friends give my ex-girlfriend a look, and also noticed my girlfriend got a bit uncomfortable. It was weird, and it got me thinking. The next day, I asked my girlfriend about it. She said that she wasn't going to lie, and admitted that she'd cheated on her ex. This was a year before she met me. I felt upset about it because she's never mentioned it before and I asked her what happened. She mentioned that one time she got drunk and hooked up with her friend, let's call him B. B is a former friend with benefits of hers and they still hang out regularly. I know that my ex-girlfriend and B had a history and while I didn't like that they hung out, I just dealt with it. I was pretty upset because not only did I find out that she was a cheater, but she still hung out with the guy. I told her I needed some time to think and after two days, I decided to break up with her. I didn't want to tell her that she can't be friends with B, and I knew I couldn't deal with her still being friends with him, so I just removed myself. Am I the jerk? You never clarified with her before starting to date her that these were deal breakers, so you're the jerk for that, but you do you. What someone does in past relationships doesn't dictate what they do in future relationships, but you're still young enough to lean towards black and white thinking, so whatever. I think you have some insecurities you need to deal with in therapy, firstly. Secondly, while she may have cheated on her previous partner, there is nothing to indicate that she would have cheated on you. Relationship dynamics change from partner to partner. I think he may have jumped the gun. She may not have told you because she was ashamed and embarrassed about it. She's obviously very comfortable with B, and as some people have mentioned, if she has such chemistry with him, maybe she should be dating him instead of you. But that's not what we're discussing. I personally think you jumped the gun because of your own insecurities. You have no right to hold her responsible for a past mistake you were not part of or involved in. Imagine being judged severely for every wrongdoing of your past. If you have changed and grown, that would suck. People do change and grow. Just say this relationship isn't working for you, but don't blame a past transgression that didn't involve you. You're the jerk. Oh, grow up. I've had it with insecure men who are obsessed with trying to control us. She has every right to be friends with B and hang out with him as much as she wants. They have a past history? So what? I have tons of guy friends, and some of them, guess what, I've hooked up with. So if you expect me to stop hanging out with them just because I have a new boyfriend who's insecure as heck? It's 2023, dude. If you think you're going to find someone you can control and not let her hang out with other guys just because they used to be friends with benefits, you're sadly mistaken. So again, grow up. Actually, instead of growing up like you're suggesting OP does, I think he just needs to find someone with value similar to his own. That's what I did, and we've been married going on four years now. I didn't find her in my country, though. Had to take my search overseas to find someone who would treat me with the same level of respect that I treat her with. Husbands and wives are supposed to respect each other and honor each other. It makes me sad how many of y'all don't think that's the case anymore, simply because it's 2023. I have to wonder what caused so many of you to think this way. Did you not grow up in a loving home with a mother and a father? They are supposed to set the example for you on how a family is meant to interact with each other. You all just sound so toxic, mean-spirited, and rebellious. You're the jerk. Have you ever made a mistake in your life, or are you an angel? As for her being friends with B, you never even gave her a chance to choose you. By all means, break up with her if you want to, but it's got nothing to do with anything she's done wrong. You clearly just don't want to be with her, and you're looking for any excuse to leave. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for breaking up with his girlfriend over this or not? Please let us know. These stories are so addicting, but the replies, they make me wish for a comet.
Why were the dinosaurs the lucky ones? We deserve it so much more. I'm 50, male. My wife, who's 48, abandoned me two months ago to go find herself. My wife, Mary, her family has a history of dementia, developing memory issues in their mid to late 50s. Her mom, grandmother, and several other relatives on her mom's side have developed dementia. Her mom lived with us for four years until earlier this year. Her father has passed. Our kids are independent and live out of the house. Oldest is in her last semester of college and the younger enlisted. The last four years were tough on us, our kids, daughter moved for college but moved back in for a bit during lockdown, and our marriage. Living with someone with dementia is brutal. We had talked a lot the last year about taking the remaining college funds, our regular savings, sell or rent the house. We were ready to downsize anyway, quit our jobs and travel for a year or until the money runs out. We just had to wait for her mom to move into a home. I understand her anxiety about developing dementia and I was burned out. You live through lockdown working remote, a wife working remote, a college and high school student taking remote classes, and a mother-in-law with dementia and see how you hold up. Space finally opened up and we were able to move her mom into a care facility. I finally thought I had a chance to breathe. When we moved Mary's mom out, Mary's mental health took a huge downward spiral. I went from caring for her mom to caring for her. She felt guilty about putting her mom in a home and had lots of anxiety about developing dementia. Our plan was to start our traveling summer of 2024. Two months ago, I get home and she's left me a note. My friends call it Exhibit A. Basically, she was going on our trip without me. She had quit her job, took most of the savings, and wasn't sure when she'd be back. Maybe a year, maybe sooner. She knew I'd understand. Her location is turned off and my calls go directly to voicemail. I texted the kids a picture of the note. We have our own checking accounts for direct deposits of our paychecks but we had transferred most into a joint account to pay the household bills and savings. We both had access to main savings account. We have joint credit cards we used for household expenses. The two cars and mortgage are joint. We both have our own small savings accounts, our own retirement accounts, equally funded, and our own credit cards for gifts and fun things. I closed all joint accounts and cards. I waited a month to see if she'd come back, hopefully before she spent our savings. After receiving only one text the first month, I went to a lawyer. She basically said there was very little to do right now other than change the beneficiaries of my retirement accounts and life insurance. Yay, my wife gets nothing else if I pass alone while she's having our adventures. It was only a month and there was no way to serve her papers. My lawyer advised me to keep paying the mortgage and the cars. The cost of trying to get a judge to approve the sale of joint assets was more than making payments. I didn't want to ruin my credit by letting one of our cars get repossessed, but I can't sell it because she's on the title. I get random texts and she sporadically posts on Instagram. Of course she has comments turned off. I want to block her so bad, but my lawyer advised me that it's better to maintain a communication channel that's not through our kids. Her last post was from Hawaii. She put in the comments how great a husband I was for letting her take this trip. I'm barely making it paying two cars, a mortgage, household bills, insurance, hoping there are no emergencies because I have no savings and she's enjoying our trip. Forget her. I'm so upset with her. I helped take care of her mom for four years and her when she fell apart after her mom moved into a memory care home and she returns the favor by abandoning me. I'll never get to take this trip and have to put off retirement. My only solace is the kids are upset with her, but they'll probably forgive her eventually. Double forget her. I'm no fool. She's hooking up with guys. She looks good. She'll have zero problem getting men. I texted her and asked her if she was cheating on me. A week later, she responded that she wasn't. Sure. So I'm drinking alone on a Friday night, and she's somewhere, probably on a beach, enjoying her life. Triple forget her. Edit. My lawyer has given me a bunch of advice and options. It was just way more than I could include in the post. I could definitely push the issue harder, and I might need to at some point, but all that work is very expensive. Finding her, serving her, getting a judge to sign off, that's not cheap. I'm following up soon and I plan on talking about the savings and my finances. Until I paid all the bills and realized how little was left, it didn't hit me that I had to worry about money. Thank you for letting her take the trip is basically her saying, when I get through living the single life, I'll be coming back to the comfort and security of married life. When she returns, I'd say, welcome home, here are your walking papers. OP. She 100% is under the delusion that she's coming back to a marriage. She's had a few conversations with our daughter and she's convinced I'll understand and forgive her.
Tell your daughter to pass along the message that you're filing for divorce for abandonment and see if this gets you some traction. I don't generally like the idea of going through kids, but they need to have your back on this. Maybe even tell her they'll cut her off as well if she keeps doing this to you and the family. Maybe even start posting about how she's living the good life and letting your friends and family know what kind of pickle this has put you in. Everyone probably assumes you're on board if you're not purposefully driving the true narrative. OP. She only hears what she wants to. I asked her to send me an address to serve her papers. She only told me that we'll work it out when she comes home. My daughter tells her all the pain she's causing, but she just says that she only has 5 to 10 years left until she gets dementia. It's impossible to know if she'll even develop it, but shouldn't she be spending this time with her family? Update. I'm feeling much more positive now that the financial situation has become a little more manageable. Basically, I'm running up debt that will get paid off when I sell the house. Even with the lawyer fees, I have six to eight more months before I have to worry about money, assuming there are no emergencies. My friend's wife gave me some good advice. Don't go from being a hero to a villain in your kid's eyes. How I talk about and treat my wife will determine my future relationship with my kids. I don't give a hoot about her, but I don't want to make her a sympathetic figure or drive them away from both of us. I followed up with the lawyer. Basically, she said we're going to have her pay back the savings she took through a reduction in her share of the assets. Any division of assets will include the savings she took. She'll also have to repay the money I spent maintaining the household while she was gone. There's plenty of equity in her share of the house and her retirement plans to cover that. She said that our finances are so intertwined after nearly 25 years of marriage, my wife is going to get some share of the assets. Best case is she agrees to the terms of the divorce and it's relatively cheap and quick. Otherwise, it gets complicated and expensive. She gave me a lot of options on how much I can expect to spend so I decided to just mostly wait. I got a couple of credit cards with promo rates for purchases and transfers that gives me breathing room and I can conserve cash. I'll just pay them off when I sell the house. Now that my financial situation is less stressful, I'm actually enjoying her being gone. I'm free to do whatever I want, whenever. I don't have to cook or clean or take care of anyone. The house is quiet for the first time I can remember. I loved my wife, but her mental health weighed down our marriage. On balance, it was worth it until now. The first month or so, I expected her to be there whenever I'd get home. When someone was at the door or if I heard noises, I would think it was her. I'd check the doorbell cam obsessively. I'm not looking forward to her returning. It has to happen, but when she comes back, I'll have to deal with her. The divorce, getting the house ready to sell, dividing our stuff, finding a new place to live. I'm hoping she'll stay away until after New Year's, but my daughter said she thinks her mom will be home for Christmas, either to stay or visit. My lawyer will have papers ready to serve her. Hopefully, she'll just agree to the terms and continue her travels. I am infuriated on your behalf. The audacity of, my husband is so great for letting me take this trip. The petty in me hopes she'll be home for Thanksgiving because I want her world to explode. OP. She's told her family she won't be home for Thanksgiving. Nobody told her my daughter and I are spending Thanksgiving with her family though. She can see the post of us having a good time without her. Please change the locks on your house so she can't just waltz back in while you are out one day. I'm so angry for you. I've been married for 23 years and if my husband did this to me, God help anyone between me and him. OP. She left her keys. I changed the code on the security system, the passphrase, and the password. I also found a new hiding place for the emergency key we had in the backyard. So she's just going to blow through all the money and then assumes you'll take her back and care for her when dementia hits her? OP. That seems to be her plan, but it's not mine. Am I the jerk for walking my daughter down the aisle when my husband has been her stepdad since she was 10? I lost my first husband when my daughter, Kala, who's 24 now, and Hawthorne, who's 26, were only 6 and 8 years old. I remarried 4 years later. I met my husband a year after losing my late husband. We were friends for several months, dated some, stronger feelings developed, and I introduced him to the kids to see how they would get along. We halted for a year while my kids and I did some therapy because their reaction to my husband was strongly negative, because they didn't want to replace their dad. But once therapy was ongoing, they were doing better. From there, things moved faster, but the kids were on board for things to move on. They were clear, however, that my husband was not going to be filling the role of a dad in their lives. My husband said he was fine with that as long as he was respected and they could work towards being a caring family. Kella and I were always close, but she was a real daddy's girl. Losing her dad was extremely tough on her. She did form a nice relationship with my husband, 
but it comes nowhere close to the bond she had with her dad. From the age of 12, she and I became much closer. I think my parenting style, as well as my willingness to talk about her dad, even after I remarried, made me someone she felt she could be open with. She was 15 when she told me if she ever got married, she would want me to walk her down the aisle and for us to do a mother-daughter dance instead of a father-daughter dance. I told her we could dance to the song her dad used to sing to her. She said she loved the idea. Even though she seemed to mean it, I always assumed things would change when she got older. I figured she would choose to walk alone or for her brother to walk her down the aisle or with her husband. But when she got engaged three weeks ago, she asked me right away. She brought up our past conversation and told me she wanted exactly that. I told her I would be honored. We cried tears of joy together. I told her that her dad would be so proud. My husband took the news in a way I did not expect. His first question was whether I suggested she ask both of us to do it, and I told him no. Then he asked if she ever considered asking him, and I said I could not answer that for her. He asked me if I thought of him when I said yes. He asked whether I gave any thought to all he has done for Kella, for both kids, and the fact he's still not looked upon as a fatherly figure after all of these years. I told him I did not think of him when asked because I was overjoyed. He told me I should have given him a lot more consideration and I should have tried to compromise with my daughter. I thought he would change his stance, but now three weeks in and he feels that I was wrong. He told me he felt he deserved more from all of us, but especially me. He said I'm his wife. I should be working on making sure he's respected and honored for his contribution to the kids' lives. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your husband should respect your daughter's wishes. Although I wonder, does he feel entitled because he's the stepfather or is he contributing financially with the wedding? If it's the latter, maybe that's why he feels that way. Either way, it's your daughter's decision. Not the jerk. Your husband is dead wrong. This isn't about him and all he's done. It's about Kala. She lost her dad, and while the grief fades a bit over the years, big events bring it roaring back. Her wedding is going to be bittersweet. She needs her parent, the one she's always had and who loved her dad, to give her away. I'm surprised that you expected Kala to change her mind, and I'm glad you accepted and did not try to offer any alternate suggestions, thereby ruining the moment. I'm not sure what your husband thinks he deserves, but he's coming off as quite selfish and entitled. Y'all went to therapy while you were on pause with him, but has he ever been? He needs it. While I do think it's nice to generally consider others' feelings, she doesn't owe it to her stepdad slash your husband to apologize about this. She's been clear about what she wanted for years. He's the one who decided he should be given the role when he was never promised it. She's not responsible for his feelings. You aren't either, OP, so while you can show empathy and try to understand where he's coming from, he owes you and Kala the same. Empathy and understanding someone else's perspective that doesn't center him. You're the jerk and so is she. Stay away from single moms. You will never come first to her or her kids and you will always be something they settled for. A walking ATM since the real father is not there. This man literally spent the last 14 years providing for this brat and she still has zero respect for him. Sorry, but if you're dumb enough to marry a single mom, don't be surprised when it finally clicks that you aren't the real father and you will never be respected as one. And have fun looking at pictures of your wife's true love in your house every day since Reddit thinks you have no right to control whether or not pictures of this man go up in your house. Wow, you sound so bitter. Who hurt you? As a single mom myself, all I can do is laugh at your stupidity. Walking ATM? What exactly do you expect? For us to look for deadbeats who can't afford to provide anything for us and our kids? My first husband was a complete loser who refused to even work from day one. And you think I should have stayed with him? We want kind men who aren't afraid to step up and play the fatherly role for our kids. Will they ever be the real father? Of course not. But a good man will understand that and do everything he can to fulfill that role as if our kids were his own. It's an honor to be a father, biological or not, and you sound like you absolutely don't deserve to be a stand-in father to anybody's kids. With your attitude, I doubt you ever will. Have fun being lonely and single the rest of your life because no woman in the right mind will ever give you the time of day. Oh gosh, quit projecting. Unlike you, I have an actual family. Look at my post history. My wife and I have been married for 10 years and we have three kids. Sorry, but the only one who's going to be lonely and single is you, stuck with those kids you decided to have with a man who you claim refused to work. Yet, you had multiple kids with him. You sound like a real catch, and I'm sure your kids will grow up to be wise and intelligent just like their mother and father. 
LMAO. Am I the jerk for telling my parents it's not my job to provide for my siblings when they cannot? I, 20 female, am the oldest of four and I do not live with my parents anymore. Our relationship is not good either. One of the biggest reasons is my parents flipped the script with my siblings when it came to gifts for Christmas and birthdays. My siblings are 16, 14, and 11, so four years between me and their next kid. I know it's a bigger gap than, say, two years, but it's not huge either. Yet, they parented them so differently and spoiled them. For me, gifts were needs and not wants, and I was told I should be appreciative of having food in my belly, a roof over my head, and clothes on my back. If I asked for something I wanted, they would tell me I didn't need it. I didn't need a doll. I didn't need art supplies. I didn't need a toy kitchen. They never ever said that to my siblings. They would get dolls, action figures, bikes, trampolines, paint sets, jewelry, all kinds of fun toys. They also got cell phones and tablets when they got older. I normally got clothes. Sometimes I would get cheap basic hygiene products, body wash and stuff. My parents made it a huge point to nip it in the bud when I was upset with my underwhelming gifts, especially when my siblings came along. They told me that they were babies, they were little, etc., but that energy was never there for me. I do resent it. Yeah, I had all the basics, but my siblings had so much more than that. My siblings are also very spoiled and entitled because of it. My sister, who's 16, used to bug me and get frustrated with me for not having nice stuff that she could borrow. She asked me once what was the point in having a sister if she couldn't raid my closet. I told her it wasn't my fault our parents didn't buy me nice stuff like her. She laughed and told me that's what being the oldest means. My brothers would tell me to buy them stuff and say they got pocket money, so I did too. But I never got pocket money. When I explained that I didn't get it, it would end up with them saying I was a baby. I moved out of my parents' house and in with my aunts. I stayed with them for several months when I started college and now I share an apartment with some friends while we all attend college. I also work. My parents have fallen on hard times now and right before Christmas. They told me they don't have the money to get my siblings what they want for Christmas and told me I need to let them borrow money or buy the gifts on their behalf and they would pay me back. I told them it's not my job to provide for my siblings when they can't. They argued that my siblings would be disappointed to get nothing from their wish list. I told them they don't need nice gifts. They only need clothes and food and a roof over their heads, and they have all that. My parents said I'm a terrible big sister. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. First and foremost, it's not your responsibility to provide for your siblings. As you said, they have everything they need along with nice things they already have. It's your parents' fault for raising your siblings in a way that they will be unhappy if they don't get things from their wish list. Not that gift giving should be about getting credit, but because you'd be helping pay for the gifts, it's not like you'll be getting any of the credit either. If they're only able to get a couple of gifts they want, you're not going to get any credit for helping out to make that happen. In fact, your parents are already using this as a way to guilt trip you, so if someone complains, I have no doubt they'll use you as a scapegoat. My jeweler husband won't give me jewelry for gifts. Am I the jerk for getting them myself? My spouse and I are both jewelers. You'd think this would make gift giving easy. Wrong. For the past five or six months, I've been asking my spouse for a very specific necklace for my birthday and the holidays. I showed him photos, gave him the designer's contact info. Every time he'd ask, what do you want for your birthday? I'd say, that one necklace. Well, the day is almost here. Husband has zero plans made for anything, and as for the necklace, he informed me he doesn't feel it makes an appropriate 50th birthday gift. What? We are literally jewelers. We make a living selling jewelry to be given as gifts. This is literally what we've done for decades. So it's appropriate for someone else, but just not me? That totally bizarre and bewildering statement aside, I got the necklace for myself after spouse confirmed he didn't buy it and didn't plan to. Now he's upset that I got it at all. He sneered when I told him I got it via trade, remember we're both jewelers, and he more or less scoffed. No congrats, no, happy you finally got it, just a sneer and an eye roll. And a left-handed comment like, I don't even know why you like that necklace so much, I don't get it. It's the designer's number one seller by the way. So am I the jerk for getting it myself? He wasn't going to do it, he went so far as to say it was inappropriate as a gift. It's not, it's just a gold link chain and I really truly did want it. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I can't imagine stating over and over what I want and essentially being ignored or belittled each time. He's made every excuse to not give it as a gift and you finally responded correctly by buying it yourself. 
It very much seems that, for whatever reason, he wasn't going to give it to you and did not want you to have it. Honestly though, if your descriptions of his behavior is accurate, I'd wonder what's underlying this. It's strange behavior for a loving relationship and it seems like something more is going on. If you want the marriage to be healthy and functional, I would think it's necessary to address the deeper issue. My ex would never get me what I asked for. I never gave specifics, just said and pointed at things and said, that would be a great gift for me. He later told me that he never bought me flowers because I wanted them so much. Mean, awful man. Not the jerk. There was a ring I loved and had asked for it for Christmas for my boyfriend. The design name was my own name and it had my favorite stone in it. It wasn't an engagement ring and I had no interest in it being one, but he refused to buy it. So I went out and bought it myself. It's still my favorite piece of jewelry and I still wear it nearly 10 years later. Best bit is that a couple of years ago, after we broke up, he saw me and commented about me still wearing his ring. I just laughed and reminded him that I'd bought it for myself. Not the jerk. It doesn't matter why you like the necklace. You wanted it for your birthday and the fact he didn't get it for you and was a jerk about it says a lot. If he wasn't going to get you the only thing you asked, then what was he going to get you? Plus, if he wasn't going to give you what you wanted, then you can get it yourself. Like Ariana says, I want it, I got it. You're the jerk. Reading all these superficial comments makes me so happy that I'm married to a woman who's smart enough to see through the jewelry industry. We laugh at how much money people waste on that kind of stuff. Your husband probably understands the industry and knows what a scam it is. Crazy that even after working in it for so long, you're still blind to it. And to all of you complaining about your husbands not buying you diamonds, please do a bit of research into the blood diamond industry. This whole industry was created a long time ago to trick you and make massive profits off of your husband's money. Again, thank goodness I married a woman who is smarter and much more mature than all of you and who doesn't cry when I buy her the wrong diamonds for Christmas. No wonder you take your husbands to the cleaners when you leave them. All you care about is consumerism. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I know I'm probably the odd one out here, but I haven't cared about what someone got me as a gift since I was like 8 years old. Like, as an adult, I don't even want gifts. I just want to spend time with people I love. If I want something, I'll buy it with my own money. Yeah, Karen, you're definitely the odd one out for feeling that way. On Reddit, that is. I had the best first date. Then he deleted his account. I, 27 female, had the most amazing date of my life last night in the two years I've started looking since being divorced. We were meeting at a Thai food restaurant. He showed up with a bouquet of flowers. No one has ever done that for me before. I was so shocked and it was so touching. The conversation was smooth and enjoyable. We both couldn't stop smiling. When we finished dinner, he asked if I would want to go and get ice cream. We both are sober, so drinks were out of the question, but neither of us wanted to say goodbye yet. We got ice cream at a local shop and then sat in my car listening to our favorite songs. We stayed there for three hours in the parking lot until midnight after they closed. We kissed and hugged a lot. It felt very natural. He gave me the best compliment and said he feels like I'm a very sweet human being and can tell that I'm genuine and caring. That compliment stood out to me since anyone can comment on looks, but it takes someone who's more invested to acknowledge parts of my personality. He asked to see me again on Friday, but then followed up by asking if he could see me today instead. I said absolutely. This morning I had a notification from my dating app, so I opened it up and saw that he had deleted his profile. I don't want to overthink or read into things, but is that typical? Should I ask him about it or just wait and see if he says something? Update. I ended up removing my first post because I was getting comments telling me that he was going to ghost me and it was a red flag. I got anxious and annoyed because we had a second date planned and that was just not true. It will not let me comment on my old post, so I'm sharing a new one instead. Yesterday, he picked me up since he lives close by. We went and got coffee and walked at a local train until it got dark. I invited him back to my place because I had baked a homemade bread and I wanted him to try it. He ended up telling me that he deleted his profile because he really wants to focus on me and feels hopeful about us. He says he understands that there's a chance it might not work out, but he doesn't want any distractions and wanted to be respectful. We had a wonderful time together and ended up falling asleep on the couch watching movies. He invited me to come to his house on Friday where he will cook me dinner. After two years of terrible first dates, I'm very optimistic. I know people told me to watch for love bombing, but I've been in therapy for three years for an old relationship and it really doesn't feel like that to me. Sometimes it's okay to be vulnerable and intentional. 
I think this guy is a very big green flag. Am I the only one who thought the dude deleted the app because he wasn't looking anymore? He sounds a bit too good to be true, but hoping this is real and a horror story isn't going to follow. I honestly just thought that he deleted it because he didn't need the account anymore because he found her. Maybe reading this subreddit hasn't made me as jaded as I thought. Dude's breaking the number one rule of online dating. Never jump into exclusive crap. He's basically telling her that now she has him by the grip and he's dedicated to her. That, A, makes him look desperate, B, shows that she doesn't have any competition to worry about, and C, that he no longer has options. This is why all guys need to have a dating coach. Deleting your dating app after the first date does not make you seem like a highly valued man at all. It makes you look like a dork who is happy you finally got lucky enough to have a woman agree to meet you and now you're head over heels for her. My Karen stepdaughter demands I pay for a useless college degree that won't even get her a job in the field that she wants to work in. My wife and I have been married for a decade. She's a stay-at-home wife and we have no kids of our own. She has a daughter from a previous relationship, Sarah, and we've gotten along for the most part. Sarah is a junior in college and pursuing a biology degree with additional courses required by medical schools. She's had dreams of being a doctor and helping people since her mom and I met. The problem is, she's not a very good student. She's failed her biology one class and had to retake it to get a B. She really struggled in her next level biology class and finished with a C. She also got a C in her chemistry class. She got a B in calculus one and two. She's making A's in her non-science and non-math classes so they're padding her GPA, which is at a 3.2. This semester, I just learned that she will make B's and C's in her science and math classes. I'm not a doctor, and I don't know any doctors, but I did online research. I found out that medical schools require many things, but at the top of the list, they require a high GPA and top grades in science and math classes. With Sarah's grades, she's not getting into any medical school. I even looked into nursing school to see if I can talk her into maybe going that route and all the ones I looked at require higher grades than what she currently has. I talked with my wife about it and she said medical school looks at other things besides grades and that's where Sarah excels. She has a solid volunteer resume and she cares about people. I argued none of that matters if her grades are not good enough. She argues that Sarah will do great in interviews. Like I said, I have no experience with medical school so I can't argue with her logic. Instead, I talked with Sarah when she came home for Thanksgiving and I told her to look into another major because she might not be cut out to be a doctor. She ran to her mom and we all got into a huge argument. I admit I lost my temper and I yelled that I'm not wasting any more money on something she'll fail at. I told them both I'm not paying for next semester's classes until she changes her major to something more realistic. I feel bad, I really do, but I'm not rich and I don't have money to waste if she doesn't have a chance to get into a medical school. Am I the jerk? Additional info. The reason why I want her to switch majors is that having a biology degree without any advanced degree is useless for my research. While I don't know any doctors, I have friends who have biology degrees without other advanced degrees and they couldn't do anything with it. One had to go back to school for another degree, one works as an assistant manager at Lowe's, another has been a receptionist for 20 years. They all advised against getting just a biology degree. While these are all noble jobs, they didn't need to pay for a biology degree just to get these jobs. I'm still willing to pay for her degree if she switches to something that will allow her to get a good job. You're the jerk. You can pay for her undergrad even if you think she can't get into med school. The biology degree will still help her to get a job, whether it's as a doctor or not. I'd pay the four years if that's what you originally agreed to. I've heard stories of non-traditional routes to becoming a doctor. If she really, really wants to, she can make it happen. I had a friend go to community college, then finish her four-year degree at a state school, go get a master's in medical science, and then still couldn't get into U.S. med schools. So she did the Caribbean medical school route. It's a harder path, but at the end of it, she's still going to be a doctor when she passes the boards and completes her residency. She can also do grad school in a different area or move into lab work in the area of biology. It would be a jerk move to cut her off suddenly. You're the jerk. Let her graduate in biology. If her MCAT scores suck, she won't get into med school and she can do graduate work in another area, like public health. That's still medicine adjacent. She can also get a master's in education and teach high school biology. She can also work in a medical lab running samples. It sounds like with her grades, she won't get into med school, but she should still finish her undergraduate degree. Well, what would you do? Would you still pay for your stepdaughter's degree or not? Please let us know.
Husband is trying to do our Thanksgiving meal himself this year and refuses my help. I cook Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners every year for my husband, his family, and our kid, and have for 16 years. I put a lot of love, planning, and effort into making it a really special day. This year, however, between work, parenting, and everything else, I'm tired and I don't want to cook Thanksgiving. I went to him and asked if we could just go to a nice restaurant instead. To my surprise, he said he'd handle it. However, even cooking a simple Thanksgiving meal requires forethought, like getting the frozen turkey in the fridge to defrost multiple days in advance. Now is the time to pick up some items. I don't know if he knows what he signed up for. I started asking when he was planning on doing his grocery run and what dishes he was planning to serve. He just dodged the question and said he'd handle it. He has a habit of underestimating tasks and rushing last minute. I finally was like, look, why don't we work together and start planning? He admitted he was only going to cook a simple meal of turkey breast, mashed potatoes, and broccoli. That's it. Basically, I said that's not actually a special holiday dinner, and I wouldn't have agreed to that had I known what he meant. I said I'd be happy to work together and balance simple things like he wants to, and special like I want. I suggested turkey, potatoes, packet gravy, box stuffing, pre-made mac and cheese, canned cranberry sauce, broccoli, rolls, and a store-made pie. He got really defensive and made it about him versus me, very black and white. Your way or my way. His offer isn't good enough to me. I'm just trying to get my way. When I explained no, that's not what I meant, he insisted that I did. I can't imagine family showing up and being served a very simple meal like that. It's just bad holiday hosting. Maybe coordinating a potluck would be okay, but he wasn't doing that. We already committed to hosting them. Am I the jerk? Oh no, OP, his family is definitely expecting more and will also probably blame you when they have to adjust their expectations so drastically without warning. Not the jerk. Let him fail. Tell everyone the minute they arrive that hubby did everything. You're not even sure what's on the menu, but you're sure it will be fabulous and all credit should go to him. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. You didn't want to do it because it's so much work, because it's a special day with special food. You suggested visiting a nice restaurant instead because it's a special day, etc. It's nice that he offered to handle it this year, but he is not really handling it. I cost Bank of America $8,000 legally. A bit of context. I've been in the mortgage and related businesses for over 30 years. I know it very well. I've never liked Bank of America, especially their servicing division. This story happened a few years ago just found out about this group. I refinanced my mortgage through a mortgage broker and, to my aggravation, they sold the servicing rights to Bank of America. The entity that owns your loan is usually different than the one that you pay to service the loan. I was upset. I estimated that Bank of America paid about $5,000 to service my loan as most folks at the time expect loans to stay on the books for at least three years. About two months after the servicing switched, Bank of America announced they'd be charging a $5 fee for the convenience to pay the mortgage online. Truly an unwarranted money grab. I'm blessed that I can put a little extra towards my mortgage payment every month. So the following month, I took out my mortgage payment plus $400 in quarters from my local bank. I then went to my local Bank of America branch and handed them my mortgage payment in quarters and repayment stub. I asked for a receipt of payment. I overpaid my mortgage to reduce the current balance and thereby reducing Bank of America's fees. The nice branch manager said, you can write a check, you don't have to pay in coins. I said I could, but I would charge a $9.50 convenient fee for the stamp, my check, and the ink used. The branch manager actually laughed and said okay. They counted the money and I got my receipt. Next month, the charge was still there, so I went to another local Bank of America branch which had gotten bad reviews on Yelp due to the hostile bank manager. I did the same thing. The branch manager said, write a check, we don't accept quarters. I said, shall I call the local state's banking commissioner, the Consumer Financial Protection Board, and the office of the comptroller of the currency, US top bank regulator, and say you won't accept legal tender? I asked to talk to the district manager. I was making a stink. About 20 minutes later, he begrudgingly had the staff count the quarters and I got a receipt. I told the manager that I would be bringing dimes next time. The next month, I brought dimes. He accepted them, but glared at me the whole time. After that payment, Bank of America rescinded their convenience fee. The month after that, I refinanced my mortgage at a lower rate. Bank of America only got roughly six months of fees for servicing, and they expected to last three years at minimum, five years to be profitable. One of my proudest malicious compliance moments. My stepdaughter, who I met four years ago, hates me 
but she demands that I pay for her college. I'm 48 male. My stepdaughter, Hannah, who's 18, is going to attend college. I've known her for around four years since that was when I married her mother. The issue though is that we've never gotten along well. I've tried, but she always says that she doesn't like me or wants her real dad. When I try to tell her stuff or scold her for behaving out of order, she says, you're not my father, you're just some stranger. My wife Emily asked her to behave properly as well, but she doesn't care to listen and in the end she stopped telling her as well. I had to pick Hannah up at school once and when a couple of people who did not know I was her stepdad asked her who I was, she said, oh, he's a servant actually, in front of my face. I was extremely mad at that and it even resulted in a huge argument, although she played it off as a joke. But that was the last straw and this happened a few months back. After that, I've always treated her as if she's invisible and barely had any interaction with her unless absolutely necessary. Well, she talked to me recently and she said she's going to apply for colleges and wants me to pay her fees now. I refused and told her to ask her real dad, who refused to pay for it himself. She began to protest and said that I'm affecting her education and that I can't do that. But I did not relent and I said she's not my business now. My wife says refusing to pay is wrong and that I overreacted even though she's not been nice to me. Am I the jerk? This is why I'm never marrying anyone with kids. It became your obligation when in fact it's not. Sad to say you're married to her mom. The mom can touch your money and spend it on her daughter's fees even if you don't agree with it. You're the jerk. You're acting worse than she is. You're an adult, not her. Not paying, that's up to you. But showing so little maturity makes you the jerk. Everyone sucks here. You are completely right and within reason to deny paying her tuition. However, you married into her life years ago. You say you basically got to know her when you got married. So you went from a nobody to a step-parent. That's hard on any kid. And if there wasn't support from both her parents and agreements in your role as a stepdad, that makes it even harder. Without a relationship, you telling her stuff or scolding her isn't going to be anything good for your relationship with her. So while she definitely sucks, I think everyone is to blame. And I don't know if this was her idea of, he wants to be a parent so here's his chance, or a sense of entitlement. But this is obviously something she wants and she's getting shot down. So while OP isn't the jerk, I don't think their relationship was set up for success. Everyone sucks here. Everyone should have been in family therapy years ago. Essentially ignoring a teenager in your home, even a poorly behaved one, is toxic. You shouldn't have even gotten married if the daughter wasn't on board. You're the jerk. You should have been respectful and polite and let her mother do the actual parenting. She's been awful, but she's a teen forced to live with someone she doesn't know who tries to act like a parent. You retaliate by ignoring her like a pouting toddler. I don't care what you pay or you don't pay. Just start acting like an adult. You signed up for this when you married her mom, my guy. Don't want to be a walking, breathing ATM for people who hate you? Then stay away from single moms. You will never be dad, but you will sure pay for everything like you are. 90% of divorces are initiated by the wife when they are both college educated. Let that sink in for a moment. But you shouldn't be surprised if you see how quick people jump to divorce him in these stories. Leave him if he won't bow down to your nonsense. You work too much. You don't make enough money. You don't buy me enough stuff. You buy me the wrong gifts. You don't take me on enough trips. You don't do enough chores. Fail any of her unrealistic requirements and have fun losing everything in divorce court. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his stepdaughter? Please let us know. What kind of monster wouldn't want to pay college tuition for a stepdaughter who hates his guts who he's only known for four years? Am I the jerk for canceling my own debt to my brother after he let his kids run amok with my art supplies? I currently owe my brother around $300. He fronted me some money for a family vacation and said I could pay him back in December. Three paycheck month. My husband and I are hosting a small Thanksgiving this year with the family members who live within driving distance and my brother's family arrived on Monday to stay through the weekend. His two kids, who are three and six, are generally well behaved but they're still kids so I let him know to keep them out of the bonus room, currently half finished, and my craft room. You all know where this is going so I'll just cut to the chase. I came home yesterday to find the kids splayed out in the living room floor surrounded by art supplies in ruined condition. They were finger painting with my supplies and had completely cross-contaminated the colors, drawn on my good watercolor paper with markers, completely crushing the tips of the markers as well, 
and ruined or dirtied several items that my friend had brought me from Korea. I confronted my brother, who was nonchalantly watching TV, and he told me that he didn't let the kids go in the craft room. He had gone in himself and grabbed them just a couple of things to entertain themselves with. He agreed to buy me replacements until I actually started tallying up the cost. Then he backtracked and said the price was BS and started insisting that most of the stuff was still in usable condition. I said, fine, you don't have to replace anything, but you can forget about vacation money. He snapped at me not to argue in front of the kids. I said, who's arguing? Sounds like the conversation is over. Now he wants me to pay the vacation money immediately and work out replacing the art supplies after. I feel like he's just going to try to haggle me or is going to replace my stuff with Crayola and call it even. Update. The cost to replace the ruined items, minus the Korean supplies, would be about $225. Getting an idea of the replacement cost of the Korean stuff is a bit harder. It was mostly journaling and stationary supplies, so I'm not 100% sure how to determine the cost of it. For example, a half-used book of stickers or a bullet journal that has several pages scribbled in. There was also a set of stamps that the kids tried to use markers on, which I'm not yet sure if they're going to need replacing or not, or if I can just clean them off myself. I was fully prepared to just deal with this the next day to get through the holiday, but my husband ended up making a call to my ex-sister-in-law, brother's ex and the kid's mom, and discussed with her what had happened. She was particularly upset that the three-year-old was allowed to use finger paint with supplies that were not specifically kid-friendly and non-toxic, and she called my brother immediately and chewed him out for that. She also called our parents about it, which turned into a call from our mother to our brother, also chewing him out for being irresponsible. And although no one brought up the money angle, and I didn't expect them to, he was rattled enough to apologize for yesterday and hasn't mentioned the money. I think I'll just pay to replace what I can and consider us even. Tell him that you'll take advantage of the current Black Friday sales to replace the numerous items he stole to give to his kids, and he can have any remainder after you replace the stolen, destroyed items with other identical products or equivalent, but no more expensive products. Not the jerk. In the future, you might want to pick up a few kid craft items when you're hosting kids. Yes, it absolutely should be the parent's responsibility, but it can be hard to have everything when you're traveling with kids. A $10 box of somewhat similar but much cheaper things to entertain them will keep any decent parent out of the rest and be met with gratitude, especially if you give them an idea of how expensive and or hard to replace your good stuff is. This is how I've dealt with my own nephews. Am I the jerk for bringing home dumpster dive eggs, which caused my roommate to end up in the ER? I, 19 male, recently moved into a shared place, and there is someone who keeps stealing my food. At first, I thought it was just a mistake, but even my leftovers were being eaten. It was very clear that the person was doing it on purpose. I spoke to my housemates about how I would just prefer to be asked first, but they were so nonchalant about it, and none of them admitted to doing it, and I haven't caught anyone in the act, so I just tried to ignore it as it only happened every couple of days or so. A few days ago, I came home from work with a carton of eggs that I found while dumpster diving and some bread. I wanted to give the eggs the water test first before eating them just to make sure that they were safe to consume, but I was too tired and I went to bed early without eating. The next day, I found out that one of my housemates got sick and ended up having to go to the emergency room. My eggs were not in the fridge where I left them, but I saw the carton and shells in the trash and my bread was opened. I had a hunch that it was him because there was a possibility that the eggs had gone bad, but I was also annoyed at the fact that he helped himself to my food without asking. When he came back, I asked him if he had eaten my eggs and bread, but he denied it. I then said, okay, but I hope whoever ate them doesn't get as sick as you did because I found the eggs in the dumpster. His face immediately dropped and he looked visibly uncomfortable. He got angry and went from saying that he may have consumed the food by mistake as he wasn't paying attention and doesn't exactly remember and accusing me of doing this to him on purpose. He said that it's a health hazard to bring such food into communal spaces without warning everyone first as it's not uncommon for people in shared places to eat other people's food by mistake. He hasn't spoken to me since this and my housemates are siding with him and calling me disgusting for doing that. A part of me feels like I wasn't wrong because they were my eggs that I was fully intending on eating and I didn't think I had to warn people against eating food that didn't belong to them. But I also do feel bad and guilty that he got so sick. So Reddit, please tell me if I was in the wrong. Edit, just to clarify because I see comments that suggest maybe I did this on purpose. I didn't. 
I've been dumpster diving for some of my food recently, so I was fully intending on eating it, just like I've been eating the food that I've been finding while dumpster diving. I try to exercise caution, and thankfully it hasn't made me sick yet. But had he not eaten it, I was probably going to end up in the ER myself, because I was obviously going to eat it. I didn't randomly do it just to try and bait and catch whoever had been eating my food. Food poisoning is no joke. As I said, I just moved recently, and I'm trying to get on my feet. I also understand that although I make sure to wipe my food first, ultimately it is gross to put food that came from a dumpster into a communal fridge or pantry and will not continue to do so. I will just put it in my room from now on. I lived in dorms for 7 years with 9 different people altogether. Nobody has ever eaten my food by mistake, or on purpose by the way, nor did I eat theirs. It's really not that hard to not eat what's not yours. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. If the housemates prefer a communal food sharing system, they had the opportunity to discuss this with you when you brought it up. They also could have asked you to label your food so they didn't accidentally mix things up, but it sounds like they didn't take that opportunity either. This sounds like karma to me. Nope, you did nothing wrong. Your forgetful roommate is a piece of work. Once or twice, I can see food going missing in a communal fridge, but chronically and with nobody fessing up to it is BS. Someone is lying to your face and eating your food. Who doesn't have the courage to admit their error and think you are dumb enough to believe their weak, lame excuse? Tell them you are insulted for this reason and your sick roommate got what was coming to him. He merely got to experience the occupational hazard of being a thief. Not the jerk. Eggs, meat, and dairy are not appropriate dumpster diving foods. Edit. To the people arguing with me that you can totally eat old eggs out of the dumpster, on a post about a person who was hospitalized due to eating old eggs out of the dumpster, please do not procreate. Everyone sucks here. He sucks for eating everyone else's food without asking, especially after you made it clear you don't want your stuff eaten. And two, why the heck are you pulling cartons of eggs and other potentially spoiled food from dumpsters? I find it hard to believe someone could eat an entire carton of spoiled eggs and not know it at any point during the cooking or eating process. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his roommate? Please let us know. I'm so glad I don't have roommates. Am I the jerk for telling my sister she was naive to think her daughter would suddenly see her stepdaughter as a true sister? My sister has an 18-year-old daughter, Casey. It was just the two of them for 10 years. Casey never knew her dad, which means my sister had sole custody of Casey. When she was little, Casey used to talk a lot about how there were these mean girls in school. One of them, Valerie, Casey disliked more than the other girls. She was the worst. My sister did her fair share of complaining about the dad too, especially when she had to replace an eraser a couple of weeks into school starting because Valerie broke it. When Casey was nine, my sister and Valerie's dad started spending time together and then they got married a year later. There was a lot of shock on my part seeing as my sister knew how Case felt about Valerie and given her own complaints about Valerie's dad allowing her to get away with so much. But he's an attractive guy, and I guess that won her over everything else. The announcement to Case went out about as well as can be expected. She was furious at her mom, more so on her wedding day, because my sister wanted the girls to match and look like sisters for the first time. Valerie used the wedding to taunt some of Case's friends, saying that she was going to replace them with her. It only added fuel to an already bright fire. Case ultimately refused to take part in the wedding on the day and sat with me instead. Things in their household were tense for years afterward. My sister would get upset that Case was so mad about it that she didn't change her opinion of Valerie at all and that she would very strongly deny that they were sisters. About two years after she got married, my sister decided they all needed family therapy. It was only in the last two years that Valerie appears to have grown and from the outside it does not look like she's the bully she once was, but Case still cares nothing for her. Both girls graduated in May and Case moved out and in with me wanting to get away from Valerie. The other day, my sister and I met up for lunch and she was venting about Case not talking to Valerie at all and how Valerie had wanted them to meet up every day after classes started. They go to different colleges, but both are local, but Case didn't even answer her. She said she thought after all these years, Case would see Valerie as a true sister and even if she didn't like her, there would be some sense of family loyalty there. I was shocked to hear my sister say that. She noticed and asked me why I looked like a fish. I told her I had never expected her to be so naive to think Case would feel that way when she hated Valerie long before she, my sister, met her husband. My sister's attitude changed very fast 
and she told me that I'm the naive little brother to think these things don't change when family bonds are created. I told her that family bonds aren't created that easily when there is already bad blood present, no matter how much she might want them to be there. She told me I owed her an apology and she'll be waiting for it. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your sister chose her partner over her daughter, bringing her bully into her home and trying to force them to play nice. Her daughter will never forgive, forget, or get over that. Well done for supporting your niece. Not the jerk. Your sister is delusional to think family bonds were created between two adolescent enemies, one of whom was actively bullying the other just because the parents got married. This isn't a Disney special. It's always crazy to me to encounter people who have this highly idealized vision in their head and the way they will absolutely demolish their relationships thinking the ideal will be realized. Your sister let her daughter down. This might have been salvageable if Casey's dislike of Valerie had been taken into account from early on. Your sister and her husband did not give it enough time or attention. I really feel sad for Casey, but honestly it sounds like she's doing alright. She isn't obligated to have a loving, warm relationship with Valerie. I can't imagine how this will play out moving forward, aside from poor Casey being essentially estranged from the whole lot. But you are not the jerk for trying to draw your sister's attention to her delusion. Am I the jerk for calling my brother's fiancé an entitled bridezilla for name-dropping me during wedding planning? I'm 28 female. My brother, JC, who's 35, proposed to his girlfriend, Izzy, who's 29, over the summer. The background of this whole drama is that I plan a lot of parties, and earlier this year, I planned the wedding of my boyfriend's sister and was a bridesmaid. I am not a professional. I just have a good grasp of aesthetics, and I know a lot of people in the local area, so my friends ask or I offer to help with party and event planning sometimes. About six weeks ago, I got a call from Izzy, asking me to be her maid of honor. I was very surprised because we don't know each other well, and my calendar in the early part of the year is so hectic, I really don't have time. I was upfront with her about this, telling her how flattered I was and that I would be happy to be a bridesmaid if she wanted, but I just wasn't able to take on maid of honor responsibilities. Izzy was annoyed about this and admitted she had expected that I would accept being maid of honor and offer to plan the wedding with her since I had for my cousin previously and my boyfriend's sister. I said again that if she wanted me to be a bridesmaid, I'd be happy to do that, but I wasn't going to plan her wedding or associated events. She begrudgingly accepted this, but I had a feeling when it came time to officially have bridesmaid, I wouldn't be one, which is fine. JC never brought this up, so I thought no more about it. A couple of days ago, I got a call from the event coordinator of a hotel I've used for events in the past. This person had questions about my wedding requirements. I was confused, obviously. It transpired that Izzy had called this hotel and used my name to get an appointment with the coordinator and then further dropped my name to try to secure a sizable discount saying that I was involved in planning the wedding. I was mortified. On a hunch, I called the owner of the restaurant where I held my parents' anniversary party to ask if he had had any contact about an event I'm planning. He had. Again, Izzy had called about hosting a bridal shower, again asking for a discount based on my name. I called Izzy and said she had nerve to be touting my name around, embarrassing me in front of people I know and work with, all without my knowledge. We argued. Izzy said it shouldn't have been a big deal to mention me, since I wouldn't help her, it's the least I could do. To which I said, not when you try to lowball my contacts and don't even ask me if I'm okay with you using me as a contact. The argument went on until I called her an entitled bridezilla and I hung up. JC says I shouldn't have said that to her, and it just let the venues tell her no on their own. But I think it's nuts that she feels entitled to use my name and then run it through the mud with people who have really helped me out in the past. Am I the jerk here? Not the jerk. This is bananas behavior on her part. She and JC are acting like there is no harm or impact on this, but there is, and they're misusing your name you've built for yourself without your consent or involvement. The way you stood up for yourself was entirely reasonable and appropriate. Not the jerk. Speak to the venue and restaurant and explain what's going on. Make sure they're clear that this has nothing to do with you. You also need to have a word with your brother about her as well. Maybe consider not going to the wedding. I know it's your brother's wedding, but she has damaged your reputation. My girlfriend's family always makes comments about what I eat. My girlfriend and I have been together for three years. Our relationship is strong, except for a recurring issue where her family is difficult and she's not always great at standing up to them for me. I'm a large man, not overweight or anything, just very tall. 
I play two recreational sports and also bike a lot in my free time. As a result of this, I eat a lot. 95% of the time I eat healthy, but in larger quantities, and the other 5% of the time I will occasionally pig out. I'm not unhealthy in the slightest. I've been to a doctor recently and he affirmed I'm in good health and I have a good healthy lifestyle by all measures. Weight, exercise, blood pressure, cholesterol, etc. So I know that I'm doing everything right. However, my girlfriend's family constantly needs to comment on what and how much I eat. They live two hours away, so when we see them, it's typically us staying at their house for a whole weekend where I'm at the whims of whatever the menu is. If I eat more than one serving of something, then the mom or sister will make comments or whisper to each other about how I'm eating into their leftovers the next day or how it's unhealthy for me to have a second cookie or something. This is even if there is a ton of food, so I know I'm not eating their whole week's budget of food or anything. I've also tried bringing my own snacks, so I'm not infringing on their supply of food with my extra eating, but this doesn't work either. I will sneak a granola bar or an apple or a bag of chips from my bag and they'll find out. I think they search the trash or something and they let me know that it will spoil my appetite or ask whether the food mom made wasn't good enough for me. My girlfriend and I also will do our own activities out of the house during the day sometimes when we visit, so I have occasionally had us stop at a fast food place if I need to eat some fries or chicken nuggets or whatever out of the house. Whenever we come back, the mom or sister will make comments or ask if we ate anywhere else while we were out, and girlfriend gets nervous and confesses because she feels guilty or doesn't like lying to them. So after three years of this, I get really sick of being attacked for the amount that I eat, even when it barely impacts them, and I know I'm eating an okay amount. It has gradually gotten worse over time. My breaking point came last week when it was my girlfriend's mom's birthday, so we met at a restaurant in the middle between us one night. I ordered a burger and fries while everyone else ordered salads, and immediately girlfriend's mom, sister, and aunt all started commenting about how the burger looked unhealthy. I stood up for myself and said that I had biked dozens of miles that week already, so I think I can treat myself to a burger. To which the sister said that one unhealthy thing can wipe out weeks of working out, which I dismissed. I was hoping that would be it, but every 10 minutes someone would make more comments. So I'm getting really annoyed. I eyeballed my girlfriend numerous times to be like, back me up here, and barely got anything. Finally the food came and my burger was perfectly normal. Not giant, not dripping with grease, not filled with unhealthy toppings, just a normal burger. But everyone was like, wow, that thing is enormous. You really shouldn't eat that in one sitting. It'll clog your arteries and you will feel terrible afterwards. Seriously, that thing is so unhealthy. I think I would die if I ate it. I decided that I was done after that. I sneaked away to the bathroom and stopped at the front of the restaurant to ask for a box and to pay my part of the bill early came back to the table and announced that I was going to get going as I didn't feel well and asked my girlfriend if she wanted a ride home or if she was going to figure out another way home. She got super embarrassed and said she would come with me if I wait a few minutes, so I got in the car and ate my burger in there while I waited like 10 minutes for her to come outside. We left and she cried the whole way home. I felt bad that it hurt her feelings, but I'm at my limit and I told her I was done going to events where we eat food with her family. And if that means that I don't come with her when she goes to visit her family, that's just the way it has to be. I said I would be skipping Thanksgiving at her parents this year. Since then, she has barely talked to me, but hasn't really fought me on it at all. I know it hurts her, but I have to stick up for myself here. I'm sick of being treated like I'm some big guy who eats garbage, when I know I live on a healthier lifestyle than any of them. I'm not even that mad at my girlfriend. Obviously, I would appreciate the backup, but I know she's scared of her family since they're all bullies. So, I'm just not going to allow myself to be present at these opportunities. Whatever fallout happens as a result of this is just not my responsibility. Am I handling this right? Is there a nicer way I could have said everything or been gentler with my girlfriend? I don't want to hurt her feelings, but I have the right to protect myself if she won't. I'm married to a 6 foot 5 beanpole who still eats like a starving teenager. When we visit my parents, my mom stocks the fridge with extra food, prepares special meals she knows he loves, and takes us out to eat at his favorite burger place. Although she goes above and beyond what is required of a host, I don't know of any culture where it isn't rude as heck to deny a guest additional servings if there's plenty of food left. Or, God forbid, mention the lack of leftovers. If they're hosting a meal, they should cook an appropriate amount of food to feed everyone they invited. I think it's clear that their family has a deeply unhealthy relationship with food. Instead of enjoying being with their family to celebrate a birthday, they chose to harass you over your meal. 
Your girlfriend has probably been subjected to these comments for her entire life. However, she needs to step up and tell them to lay off of you and keep their thoughts to themselves. They're being incredibly rude and unwelcoming to you while she sits by and says nothing. I support your decision to no longer attend family meals with her and your refusal to visit for Thanksgiving. Maybe this will be the wake-up call that she needs. Am I the jerk for putting a tracker in my wife's car? Wife and I have been together for over 25 years and she's always done the bingo thing with her mom. I have no problems with that and they've been doing it for years, maybe once or twice a month. Again, no problem. Her mom has always been a gambling addict and it caused the divorce of her first husband, but she wiped out her second husband's bank account within a couple of years. So I'm always a bit leery on the whole gambling thing. I've seen it destroy families. Her mom lives with us now. Uh-oh. 15 years ago, I worked out of state a lot, so she's always had control of our joint banking account. My checks were auto deposit, so never really broke down our bills as I should have. After I kept pressuring her to tell me where all our money was going, she broke down and told me she gambled it away at the casino. Slot machines. Big fight. At that point, I got a separate checking account, so at least the bills would be paid on time. I make a bit more than she does, but I pay most of the bills and am still able to save up money every month. This has never been sustainable though since any surprise bills, we have two teen kids, it's always me that pays for them. She's broke every month. When we were going over our tax returns, it turned out she owed $6,000 in taxes, all from the casino. We went over the whole gambling and financial problems again and she shook my hand and promised she would stop. Fast forward a few months, I bought a tracker online, one that I could put on my tractor. I let friends borrow it and wanted to keep track of it in case it was stolen and the kid's car since they're turning 16, so I wanted to keep track of them. I had the tracker for a few weeks and decided to try it out one day. I threw it in the console of my wife's car just to see how the app works. She took off with her mom before I could tell her and she texted me they were heading out shopping. Well, they went straight to the casino instead. I wasn't mad, but was definitely concerned. I feel guilty for spying on my wife, so I took it out and never said anything. However, curiosity killed the cat and I threw it back in her car a few weeks later, this time on purpose and hidden. It's been a couple of months and they've been at the casino at least twice a week. Not the bingo hall, but the actual casino. I confronted her again today when she asked for money for kids' gymnastics. I asked her how her gambling issue was going and she denies she's back to gambling. I gave her many outs and she wouldn't admit it. So I then told her about the tracker. Now she's furious that I tracked her and started calling me names. Sorry this posted all over the place, I'm just super nervous. We've been together for 25 years and I'm freaking out. To clear up some info, my wife and two daughters already track each other on their iPhones. They always know where everyone is, except for me since my phone is a crappy Android that doesn't connect with their phones. I work construction, so my phones don't last long. I just replace it because it's cheap and I don't need anything fancy. The tracker I bought was just for tracking the vehicles if they were stolen or something. Yes, I should have confronted her about it the day I was testing out the tracker. Huge mistake and it led to me being a creeper. I can't deny that part. I think I was just hoping it was a one-off white lie and not a normal thing. Update. Well, we had a fight. At first, it was mostly her on the attack for all the things I do wrong that push her to the casino. I expected this and was able to turn it back around and keep the focus on the gambling. Long story short, lots of crying and opening up. I told her that she was the one person in the world that I trust the most and she's also the one person that lies to me the most. That was the breaking point and a long vulnerable discussion about where we are in our marriage and where it's going. It's been a long time since we've had one of these. She has agreed to open up her finances so we can figure out what to do there. I have no idea how much we're in debt yet, but it sounds like quite a bit. Hopefully it's manageable. We're going to see a marriage counselor and she also agreed to go to a gambling addiction counselor. Mother-in-law is probably going to move out. Granted, this is just the beginning, and who knows what will happen down the road, but it's a start. I'm pretty exhausted. We'll see how things are tomorrow. Thank you for the opinions and advice. I guess I don't care if I was the jerk anymore. It had to be done, and I have no regrets. I swear, these you violated her privacy people are the worst. She nearly wrecked them financially, but God forbid OP makes sure she's not trying to do it again. I'm not sure how I feel about this. On one hand, I strongly disagree with secretly tracking anyone, but I'm not sure if the wife would have come clean otherwise. Tough decision. On the plus side, it seems like they may be able to work through it. 
the mother-in-law moving out was a crucial step towards them having any hope of reconciliation. I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, I have serious doubts about the oopsie, it was a total accident that I put the tracker in there and forgot to tell them. But I guess ultimately the gambling is the bigger issue. To everyone out there, I know a man who put a tracker on his wife's car to prove she was cheating. She was cheating, but she went straight to the police and had him arrested for stalking and harassment of his own wife, still married and a jointly owned car. He even went to jail for a few weeks. She used the conviction in the divorce and she got the house, full custody of the kids and a large portion of his business. When he got out of jail, he couldn't even visit his parents because she still lived close enough to them that the restraining order prevented him from being there. He had to buy parts of his business back from her and could only have supervised visitation of his kids for the first two years. The judge was sympathetic, giving the lowest sentence he was legally allowed to, and everyone knew he hadn't really done anything wrong. But using trackers on your spouse without their knowledge and consent is extremely illegal. Do not use trackers. It can go incredibly wrong for you, no matter what you're proving. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Nothing's worse than being in a relationship with someone with a bad addiction who lies to you about it every day. Karen's server refuses to refund my tip. I went into a burrito bowl place to order takeout. They had this new tip option on the card reader that they've never had before. The card reader is not touchscreen, nor are there tabs on the side to select options. They're just numbers. Before I paid, the screen asked what amount I wanted to tip. 20%, 25, 30, or other. I tried to press the number 4 for other, but the button didn't work. I told the worker that number 4 did not work and asked the worker what to press for other, and she told me 3. After I selected 3, it added a 30% tip to my card. I told her I wanted to select other and not 30%. She told me she was not aware that I was not trying to tip and she thought she remembered the order number. I asked her to refund my tip. And she said that's not possible since they can only refund actual orders if there's something wrong with the food. I told her the card reader buttons were not working properly and it doesn't have an easy or obvious option to select no, nor did the right option work. She refused to refund me saying, it wasn't that much money anyway. I asked to speak to the manager, telling the manager they need a more user-friendly option to select no on the card reader. And the manager told me all the card readers are like that, which it's not. Other places have a no option and are touch screen. She told me my tip would be really appreciated and it would help her staff since the holidays are coming up and this could be my way to make someone's day. I told her that because they are using a system like this, they don't care about their customers, let alone their coworkers, if they need to even rely on scamming people to get tips and I want a refund. The manager asked me why I selected a 30% option if I wanted to select other and I told her the number for other didn't work and when I asked her worker about it, she told me the wrong answer. She told me I was gullible and blaming her worker for my own mistake and out of good customer service, she will refund my tip but told me this will not happen again. You're the jerk. See, this is why I have no problem messing with customers' food. My coworkers and I have to deal with people like you every day and I can't tell you how infuriating it is. You couldn't just spare a few dollars as a simple thank you to the people who work their butts off making your food? I hope they ban you from their restaurant and that you learn to show a little compassion. Rich boy goes to Chipotle and accidentally leaves a tip, then goes full on Karen when they aren't able to process a refund for the $2 tip you accidentally gave them. If I work there, so help me God, you don't even want to know what I'd do to your food. I've been tested a few times like this before. And let's just say, some of the entitled customers like yourself that rubbed me the wrong way got way more than they bargained for. I do chemistry in my spare time as a hobby and I always have a full kit with me at work for the problematic customers. Heck, I even add some of my secret ingredients to random customers' food when I just don't like the way they look. Dang. Mess around and find out. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the employees? Please let us know. I always tip servers well and I don't plan on stopping, but I am getting tired of these machines at the gas station that tell you to leave a tip when you're checking out for the chips that you bought. Am I the jerk for being upset that my niece requested payment when I asked her to babysit for a couple of hours? My husband, who's in his 30s, male, and I, 30s, female, we have a three-year-old son together, Max. Max is a sweet kid but has a difficult time in unfamiliar situations and he can get overstimulated easily. 
A little while ago, my husband was across the country on a work trip while I was home with Max. I got a call one morning from his manager informing me that my husband had been in a car accident and he was in the hospital. He couldn't tell me much but said that although he was stable, it didn't look good and that I should come as soon as I can. I obviously freaked out. I booked a ticket just for myself because it would be almost impossible to travel with Max and I could barely afford the last minute ticket for myself. I called my mom who lives a few hours away and asked her to come watch Max while I'm away. At this point, I needed someone to watch Max for the time it would take for my mom to arrive so I could make the flight. Looking back, I probably could have handled the logistics better than this, but I was hysterical and was just doing things as I thought of them. I called three friends. One didn't answer and two were unable to help. Luckily, we live close to my brother and sister-in-law who have a daughter who's 17, Sarah. We're very close with them. Sarah answered the door and said her parents were out. I explained the situation and asked if she had watched Max for a couple of hours until my mom came. I should note that Sarah babysits for a few local families and obviously charges them for her services. We have never asked Sarah to babysit before. She showed some concern for my husband and when I asked her again, she said something along the lines of, well, you'll pay me, right? I usually charge this much. I stared at her for a moment, not really expecting that response and then my friend who didn't answer called me back and said of course she'd watch Max. So I took Max and left without saying anything to my niece. I coordinated with my friend and my mom, then flew to see my husband. He ended up needing surgery, but is making a full recovery. A few days after he was able to fly home, we had dinner with my brother and sister-in-law. We were talking about the accident, and I mentioned that I had asked Sarah to watch Max. I also noted that I was a little upset that she brought up payment in that moment. My brother was surprised, and said he would talk to her as that's not an appropriate reaction. My sister-in-law interjected and said she was proud of Sarah for advocating for herself. She and I argued and she said that I was entitled for being surprised that Sarah asked for money. To be clear, if I asked Sarah to babysit under normal circumstances, I would absolutely expect to pay her. It was unsettling that Sarah would bring up payment while, for all I knew, my husband might not make it in a hospital on the other side of the country. I think it would have been more empathetic to bring up the topic of payment after I returned and confirm that my husband was okay. My sister-in-law is still being cold with me and so is my niece. Am I the jerk for getting upset? Not the jerk. It was an emergency, a one-off thing, and the kid is family for goodness sake. Your niece is sadly lacking in empathy and decency, as is your sister-in-law. I'll bet had she agreed, you'd have done something nice for her upon your return. Glad your husband will be okay. In my opinion, you are not the jerk because if you ask Sarah to babysit under normal circumstances, you would absolutely expect to pay her. I would normally be on her side. However, this was clearly a serious family emergency and the right thing for her to do would be to help or to ask you later on to compensate her in some more casual manner. Not the jerk. My aunt refused to babysit my brother and I when our dad almost didn't make it. This was 20 years ago. My mom's relationship with her never recovered. Niece needs to learn time and place to advocate for herself. Reddit likes to say we don't owe others anything, but you do. You owe them empathy if you expect to be part of a family unit. No jerks here. Sarah is a teenager and really all she did was ask for payment for babysitting. Socially flawless? No, but again, teenager. You were upset and worried and just didn't answer then went about your business. It may have been awkward or something you didn't like, but in my opinion, there are no jerks here. It sounds to me that Sarah has had bad experiences with other people not paying her. I know hardworking teens who have gone unpaid because they didn't know how to negotiate or set boundaries and ended up feeling foolish afterwards, especially when it comes to helping relatives. I'm not saying that you wouldn't have paid her, but she had no way of knowing without asking you. She didn't have an empathetic response to your emergency. However, just as you expect empathy for your situation, as the adult, it would be gracious if you overlooked her mistake. What would have been a kind response is to say, of course you would pay, but to privately express to her later that in the emergency situation, you were a little hurt that she wasn't more concerned about your husband as her first reaction. By bringing it up to her parents, you are making it a more awkward situation. My kids are older teens and they've benefited from relatives giving them the benefit of the doubt, but also pulling them aside and gently speaking to them. And I've done the same with my nieces and nephews. I try to come to them with the assumption that they have good intentions, but haven't learned proper etiquette yet. As a result, we have a good relationship. I don't think anyone is the jerk here, just a lot of high emotions and assumptions in a stressful situation.
No jerks here. Because you were understandably distraught, but gentle reminder, it is your responsibility to find childcare for your kid, even in an emergency, and that includes paying for it when needed. Also, she does this for work, so it makes sense she didn't want to give her services away for free. I know many family members that ask people to fix computers, for instance, that look at theirs for free. Would it have been nice if she did it for free, being that it's an emergency? Sure, but she's not obligated to. You're the jerk. I'm sorry you found yourself in such a terrible and stressful bind, but considering you would have had to pay an emergency sitter if all your contacts had fallen through, I don't think this is as unreasonable an ask as you're trying to argue it is. Although, honestly, this is the part that gets to me. You think it would have been more empathetic to bring up the topic of payment after you returned? You mean, after she had already rendered services and couldn't do anything about it if you continued to insist you shouldn't be charged, let alone try to argue, as most people would, she should have said something in advance if that was the expectation. Yeah, no. You didn't want to pay her rates, and fortunately you didn't have to. Move on and drop the shame campaign. I understand that you feel that your niece's reaction was insensitive to your circumstances, but it's not unreasonable to be asked to be paid for labor. Whether you're in crisis or not, you're still asking her to work. In fact, you believing that your emergency entitles you to free labor seems problematic to me. Did you expect the doctors and nurses at your husband's hospital to patch him up for free also? Did you expect the pilot flying you to your husband's side to do so for free? No, you paid them for their services. Why is your niece exempt from that? Gentle, you're the jerk. I understand why you reacted that way in the heat of the moment, but to continue to bear a grudge for a 17-year-old negotiating the terms of a labor agreement is unreasonable. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her niece? Please let us know. Don't you just love the way Reddit flip-flops their opinions? Karen is going to name her baby Danger if it's a boy or Tinkerbell if it's a girl. One of my friends found out she was pregnant a few months ago and she's really excited to become a mother. I'm happy for her and I think she'll make a great mom, but there's one problem. She wants her baby's name to be unique and special, but the way she's going about it is terrible. What I mean is, the name she plans on using is awful. If it's a boy, she's going to name him Danger, D-A-Y-N-G-E-R. If it's a girl, she's going to name her Tinkerbell. I wish I was joking. I asked her if she was 100% sure and I suggested that if she was dead set on those names, to make them the kid's middle name. When she asked why, I told her flat out that the kid's gonna get bullied if she names them that. I know just how crappy kids can be. I got bullied for my name and I changed it when I was 19. She got really upset and told me I was being unsupportive and I was being a crappy friend. She's been ignoring my text ever since and it's been more than a week. I'm starting to feel kind of guilty over what I said. Was I the jerk? Update. We had a conversation over call. I decided to tell her about my experience and how I was bullied for years because of my name, Shaylay. And it turns out she's been going through a lot. Birth complications run in her family and she's been really stressed out about it. Along with finding out that her boyfriend, now her ex, of three years has been exchanging daily texts with a coworker of his. I had no idea about this and she expressed regret for taking out her feelings on me. I carefully brought up some of your points and suggested using the name Bell for a girl with Tinkerbell as a nickname. She thinks that's cute and liked the idea. I also mentioned maybe using Dane as a first name with Danger as a nickname, which she wasn't quite as happy about. She did decide to use Danger, still spelled with a Y, as a middle name, which isn't nearly as bad as using it as a first name. On the bright side, the kid can tell people, Danger is my middle name. Thank you for all your advice. I really appreciate the help. <laughs> Not the jerk. She needs a reality check. She's naming adults here. These names won't set her kids up for the best shot at life and she needs to accept that. Not the jerk. I'm so sick of people assuming that anyone who disagrees with them is unsupportive. Being a supportive friend does not mean being a yes man. It means having your friend's best interests at heart. You do want your friend and her kid to be happy. Therefore, you are the most supportive. Any name should fill a person with confidence as people will have to keep introducing themselves again and again throughout their life. Well, what do you think? Is Opie the jerk for these names that she wants to give to her babies or not? Please let us know. I'm so thankful that my parents were chill about my name. If my mom had named me Tinkerbell, <laughs> Tinkerbell, I think I would still be holding a grudge against her. Am I wrong for divorcing my ex-wife over kids? 
I want to preface this by saying that I have no intentions on getting back with my ex and I'm in a very happy relationship with my now fiancé. I, 46 male, married my ex-wife, 45 female, when we were 26 and 25. At that time, we were both on the fence about having kids. I knew since college that I wanted to retire early and my dream of having financial freedom was what really made me realize that having kids didn't fit into the life I wanted. I was trying to find the right time to talk to her about it, but over the next few weeks she started dropping hints that she wanted to have kids. She started showing me photos of her friends starting their own families, commenting on our nieces and nephews, joking about her getting or being pregnant. That one freaked me out, and even bought me a book on the joys of fatherhood that she thought I'd find interesting. I set her down and asked her if she wanted kids. She admitted that over the years she had grown to want a family. We had a conversation about it and I realized that neither one of us was going to change our minds. I didn't want to keep her from what she wanted in life, so I brought up divorce. She really didn't want to divorce and kept trying to get me to want to have kids, but I stuck to what I wanted and we ended up separating. I obviously still loved her, but that's why I wanted to divorce. We were still young and she could find someone to have the family she wanted with. I didn't want her to resent me for forcing my life choices onto her. Even after I filed for divorce, she still didn't agree with me and dragged it out as long as she could, so the divorce took almost two years. I dated over the years, but never really found someone that I could see myself sharing the rest of my life with until I met my now fiancé four years ago. Apparently, my ex-wife struggled with dating as well and hasn't remarried yet. She has a son, but the kid's dad isn't in the picture. She recently reached out to me and asked if we could meet to catch up. I talked with my fiancé about it and she thought it would be a great way to clear up any bad blood between us, so I agreed to meet up with her for coffee. Things seemed to be going well until she brought up her son. She asked me if I was going to be a part of his life as a masculine influence, and I told her I was glad that she was able to have a kid, but that it still wasn't something I was interested in. She tried to change my mind by saying that we could be a family again. She kept trying to convince me, and I kept trying to change the subject. I admit that I got frustrated because things weren't going as I had hoped they would, and I told her that I was happy with my fiancé and that I was not interested in her. She started to insult my fiancé, so I left. I thought what happened was crazy. When I agreed to meet with her, it never even occurred to me that she might want to get back together, considering how long it's been, and, you know, I'm not single. She kept messaging me, so I blocked her, and I don't plan on talking with her again. I was talking with my sister and her husband about it, and they said that while I'm totally right for rejecting her now, that it was a jerk move on my part to divorce her in the first place, and that I was now being a jerk again by not being a part of her kid's life. They both agreed that my ex was right for wanting to work it out. They said it's my fault that her kid doesn't have a father, and that if I had given having kids a chance, I would have changed my mind. I just don't agree that kids are something one should compromise on. I just don't see how it's possible for it not to be a bad situation for everyone involved that breeds resentment. I don't know my ex's kid at all, and I don't agree that it's my responsibility to step up just because his biological dad didn't. I asked some other friends and family, and they agreed with my sister, so now I'm not sure if what I did was wrong, and if I'm just wrongfully justifying it to myself. You're not wrong. You did the right thing in divorcing her over having very different expectations for your lives. If you divorced her over you not wanting kids, I can't understand why she would think that you would want to be with her or be willing to fill a fatherly type role with the kid that she did end up having with someone else. Your sister and brother-in-law are crazy. Kids are not something to compromise on. They are a two yes, one no situation. OP. She used my social media posts of me with mine and my fiance's nieces and nephews as proof that I wasn't against having kids. I like kids, I just don't want any of my own. She thought I had changed my mind about kids because of the posts and said I was being a hypocrite by refusing to be in her son's life the way that I was in my nieces and nephews' lives. What they were arguing is that if I hadn't divorced my ex-wife, she could have convinced me to have kids and then her kids would have a father figure. I was the one who pushed for divorce and broke our potential family. Hopefully there's zero chance that you're the one who got her pregnant. Have a lovely remarriage and treat your fiancé like she is the only one for you. That little meetup with your ex, it cast a shadow in her mind. Help that shadow dissipate for good. Yes, low contact, the others forever. OP. We divorced 16 years ago and her son is 11, so there's no possible way he could be mine. Thanks for your concern, but my fiancé is fine. 
no shadow was created. We are both very secure in our relationship, and she was the one who encouraged me to meet up with her so she could apologize to me for how she lied and talked crap about me. Even though that's not what ended up happening, my intentions were clear and never changed. I'm about 98% sure I know who the kid's father is, and if I'm right, then I don't really blame him. I obviously feel bad for the kid, but he was, in my books, still a kid as well. The guy I think is the father is currently about 30, but he was a recent high school graduate when my ex got pregnant. My ex and him got engaged, he moved away suddenly, and nobody could get a hold of him, and then it came out that my ex was pregnant. He was in a trade apprenticeship program before he left, but I don't know where he is or how he's doing now. Update. So, some things have happened. My ex-wife somehow got a hold of my fiancé's phone number. She contacted her yesterday and made false accusations that I cheated on her when we met up for coffee. Obviously, my fiancé didn't believe her and just blocked her number. This morning, my sister showed up uninvited to my fiancé's house with her kids, demanding to talk. We don't live together and I wasn't there. My fiancé originally wasn't going to let them in, but my sister sat on her porch and refused to leave. It was cold and windy and the kids didn't have coats on, and since it's not their fault, she ended up giving in. She put on a show for the kids and made some coffee to prepare herself for whatever crap my sister was going to say. My sister started a whole spiel about how if she, my fiancé, really cared about me and not just my money, then she would do what's best for me and leave. My sister claimed that since I'll always be connected to my ex, that I will be forever unhappy if I'm with anyone else. Apparently, if my fiancé doesn't leave me, it's proof that she's only with me for my money and that it's obvious that my ex and our kid, which, what the heck, it's not even my kid, would actually use the money in a godly way. My fiancé laughed in my sister's face and just stared at her until she left. My fiancé and I are both a little confused by what she said. I am better off financially than my fiancé, but not by that much. I'm also not religious, so even if I did get back with my ex, me and my money would still not be godly. We know she's crazy, but again, why did she think her plan would do anything? After my sister left, my fiancé called me and told me what happened. I called my sister to tell her, one, leave my fiancé alone, and two, that she's crazy and delusional. She defended herself by saying she knew what was best for me and was just protecting me from going through with the wedding since my fiancé was obviously taking advantage of me and that since I'm under her spell, I can't protect myself. I again told her she was crazy and delusional, and told her that I never wanted to hear from her or anyone who's siding with my ex again, and to please pass that message on. Every time a family member or a friend messages me about it, which has been sick so far this morning, I ask them what their thoughts on the matter are, and if they side with my ex or sister, and I just block them. Am I the jerk for refusing to attend my best friend's wedding? I, 28 female, am entangled in a wedding drama of epic proportions. My recently engaged best friend, who's 29 female, asked me to be her maid of honor and words can't even describe how happy I was. We've been inseparable since kindergarten and I was ready to make her big day unforgettable. I spent nearly $700 on her bachelorette party, buying cute outfits for everyone and renting a party bus with all you can drink drinks. The other girls pitched in, but I'm the most financially stable, so the majority fell on me. I helped plan the wedding of her dreams, right down to contacting the vendors and setting dates when she was too busy. I made the save the date and invitation cards. What I'm trying to say is that I did a lot for her. And then, two weeks before the wedding, my best friend asked me to step down and said that her future sister-in-law would be taking care of the role of maid of honor. I was ticked, and we got into a huge argument over this, where I, admittedly, said some things that I wasn't proud of. Since then, I've received texts from our friends, best friend's family, the groom's family, and even sister-in-law telling me I'm a drama queen who needs to get over herself and that this isn't about me. This has really gotten to me, and I need to know, was I in the wrong? Edit. Thank you to everybody who's given me advice. I'm going to wait a week and let emotions cool off, then I'll have a sit-down talk with my friend about this. Update. I called her this morning and asked to talk. She agreed and we set up a meeting on Thursday at a local coffee shop. I'm a bit concerned because she sounded really shy and nervous on the phone. Hopefully it goes well and I can do an official update with happy news. Did you ask for the money back? OP. I tried asking for some of the money back, but she called me money hungry and said I never told her it was conditional. 
Have you talked to sister-in-law? OP. Once or twice before this went down, she's been texting and calling me to tell me what a self-centered jerk I am, but I haven't replied. Did she give you a reason for why she asked you to step down? OP. Sister-in-law is an introvert and might never get to be a maid of honor. I have a large friend group and might be a maid of honor at one of their weddings. Is she close to sister-in-law? OP. She isn't particularly close to her and even would complain about her at times. Sister-in-law is the youngest member of the nearby extended family. She's 18. I don't know if that changes things, but my friend felt like sister-in-law was coddled. A few people have mentioned the groom's family pressuring her, and I think it's likely. I thought it was extremely out of character, but one person said she might be feeling pressured to conform to the family since she wants them to like her. I'm not sure what the actual reason behind her actions are, but hopefully I can sit down with her soon and talk it out. Also, she paid for the base dress, and I was going to pay for alterations. I don't want to expose her online because we've been friends for over 20 years and I don't want to hurt her like that. I'm still hoping we can be friends. It does make me feel much better that so many people are on my side, even if it's just on Reddit. I was genuinely starting to feel like I was going crazy. Update. I met my friend at around 9am yesterday at a local coffee shop. She looked really bad. Her hair was super greasy and unkempt, she had really bad eye bags and she seemed totally exhausted. When I asked her what was wrong, she just apologized. I kept prodding and it turns out that her in-laws are real pieces of work. Apparently, they've been harassing her for nearly three years about having sister-in-law as the maid of honor at the wedding and when my friend chose me, they went ballistic. My friend said she thought she'd be able to handle it until the wedding day, but then mother-in-law threatened to ruin her wedding dress unless sister-in-law was the maid of honor. My friend panicked and that's when she told me I would no longer be maid of honor. She apologized for the money-hungry comment and said that she was just in such an awful place mentally that hearing me mention the money made her really upset. The reason all our friends were attacking me is because they knew about the mother-in-law situation, as my friend never mentioned it to me because she didn't want me to step down because of mother-in-law, and they thought I also knew the whole story. And as for the fiancé, he was completely in the dark. He doesn't have a good relationship with his mother already, and my friend didn't want to be what destroyed that relationship. When my friend told me all of this, I felt awful. I didn't know she was enduring three years of harassment because of me. I immediately apologized, and she apologized, and we both cried a lot. When the tears stopped, she pulled out an envelope with nearly $200 and gave it to me. I originally refused, but she insisted, so I took it. I encouraged her to tell her fiancé because keeping this from him wasn't helping anyone, and if he decided to cut off mother-in-law, then that was his decision and not hers. After talking a lot more about future boundaries, our relationship, and the wedding, I decided I would go to the wedding and we'd still be friends. I know my friend didn't handle this in the best way, but I've known her for over two decades and she's practically my platonic soulmate. That's not something you should throw away because of this. Originally, that was how my update ended, but as I was typing this, I received a text from my friend saying that fiancé disinvited his mom and practically half the family, including sister-in-law, because of their treatment of my friend and me. She asked if I would be willing to be the maid of honor again, and I said yes. I just want to give a final thank you to Reddit for helping me through this, and I hope all of you have a nice night. Am I the jerk for leaving Thanksgiving because my partner's creepy brother was there? I, 25 female, and my partner, 26 male, have been friends for a few years and started dating more seriously earlier this year. This was the first time he's invited me to Thanksgiving. He called it a Friendsgiving when he pitched it. His parents, who I adore, were hosting it, but it was mostly their friends and his friends, not extended family, as he put it. I guess for whatever reason, I assumed his brother wouldn't be there. I've tried really hard to be nice to his brother, but he's always creeped me out with his staring, hovering, etc. But he reads as neurodivergent, I think he's diagnosed ADHD, but it seems a lot more severe to me. But I tried to be nice. Then last year, my partner asked if his brother could come with us and our friends on our big summer renaissance fair road trip, and I told him how uncomfortable around his brother I am, and I didn't want him to spoil this trip, and nicer words than that. And my partner assured me he wouldn't, but he kind of did. I felt like I was babysitting a kid for most of the trip, but whatever. It was a few weeks, and after that, my partner posted something on Instagram, and his brother commented, and I went to snoop on his Instagram as one does, and saw that he had drawn a bunch of creepy, gross drawings of me while we were on our road trip. I mean, very obviously of me. I brought it up to my partner, and he mostly seemed to brush it off. 
I didn't exactly say how uncomfortable it made me, but I also don't feel like I should have to spell that out. I've been pretty clear that I don't want to be around his brother after that. I've had dinner with him and his parents occasionally, but his brother usually isn't there or he stays up in his room. He might come down to get a plate or whatever we're eating and pass by, but he never stays. I thought because my partner conveyed to him that I'm not okay with being around him. Anyway, Friendsgiving today, I was honestly having a blast. I got up early and spent all morning making side dishes. I was enjoying spending time with our friends and his parents. And then his brother turns up and gets sat at the kids' table with us right next to me. It isn't even that he was there, but that my partner didn't feel inclined to warn me or make sure we weren't sat together or anything. I feel terrible now, like I overreacted, but I just got up to leave. I went over to his coat and I got the keys, and when he asked what I was doing, I might have raised my voice a bit and told him he could either spend time with me or his creepy brother, which was maybe not the right thing to do in front of this whole 20-person gathering. We also drove together, so I kind of left him stranded, but he was at his parents' house with his side of the family, and we live nearby. Someone probably gave him a ride. I went to my sister's about 40 minutes away. He hasn't tried to call or text me. Did I overreact? Am I the jerk? I'm staying with my sister and she's ready to go into this situation swinging a baseball bat. But I knew she'd be like that and I wanted some more candid opinions from people who aren't already on my side. The main advice I'm getting is to be more explicit with my communication and this is honestly something I've been working on for a while. My family isn't a directly and verbally express your needs family which isn't an excuse, but hopefully is an explanation. I try to remind myself that no one can read my mind and failed in this case. I really shouldn't have blown up at the party and I'm extremely aware of that. I wish I had stepped out with my partner and reminded him of my feelings about his brother and given him a chance to correct it. I'm sure we've all gotten angry and wished we could take it back. And I guess I should have assumed he would be there. My partner specifically pitched it as some of his friends and some of his parents' friends, and if he had just come down to get a plate like he normally does, it would have been fine. His brand of neurodivergence includes not liking big crowds of people. Also, this guy is 24. I forgot to include that in my main post. He's not a kid. Anyway, I hadn't really had the perspective to consider the long-term feasibility of just avoiding my brother-in-law. I'm going to text his parents to apologize. I should call, but I don't want to demand their attention if they're really upset with me and explain a little where it was coming from. I took screenshots of the Instagram posts that I'll share with them if they ask. I'm going to suggest a pause with my partner through the holiday season, at the very least, if he doesn't dump me first that is. I don't think this relationship is feasible if he isn't going to do the bare minimum of trying to keep me safe. Not the jerk, and let's be clear, your partner's parents raised both of their sons to be this way. Your partner is just better at hiding it. It's time to confront him straight up. If he isn't willing to accept that his tolerance of his brother's behavior is disrespectful and disgusting, then he's gotta go. Or just dump him without confronting him. I don't fault people for breakups via text when behavior is that egregious. Not the jerk. I'd yell too if my partner had been that dismissive of something that is a very serious issue. He should never have put you in that situation. If he doesn't apologize to you in essay format with the full MLA works cited page, then he's gone. Seriously though, a partner should never violate boundaries like that, especially ones you very clearly stated. Not the jerk. I do think you should have assumed his brother would have been at Thanksgiving at his parents' house, so it's weird that you assumed otherwise. That being said, your partner doesn't seem like he takes your concerns seriously. It sounds like he's probably going to continue blowing off any concerns that you have about his brother, so I don't know why you'd think he's going to choose you over him. Ever. You're the jerk. So this guy, who you yourself said is neurodivergent, drew some pictures of you that you didn't like, and now you don't feel safe, and you are yelling at your boyfriend, who had nothing to do with it, in front of their whole family at Thanksgiving? And you really think that you're the one in the right? Good thing for them, they won't have you and your drama there next year. Hope your ex can find a decent girlfriend who will laugh at his brother's drawing. At least, that's what I would do in this situation. He obviously has a crush on you, and instead of hitting on you, he's drawing pictures of you. If that makes you flip out the way you've described, you should probably get some professional help. Everyone sucks here. Yes, the brother sucks. Yes, your boyfriend should probably be more proactive. Yet, you blowing up out of seemingly nowhere isn't cool. 17 of those people probably had no idea what happened. The way you handled the issue was rude, especially to the hosts. 
It's pretty ridiculous to not expect the guy to be at his own house, especially if you didn't say anything and didn't ask if he would be there. You could have chosen to not come to the Thanksgiving at all. You could have clearly and directly asked your boyfriend to run interference. Or you could have stood up and moved seats. In the long run, you're the jerk to yourself if you don't learn to speak up and voice your thoughts and opinions when they come up. It sounds like you didn't fully and honestly express yourself at least three times. People aren't mind readers. Not everyone thinks the same way. You can't just hope your boyfriend will know exactly what you want when you are using nicer words. If you don't want to be around the brother, you should straight up say, I don't ever want to be near your brother again. If he is around, I will leave. That's a healthy boundary. Don't be shy to make your boundaries 100% clear, otherwise you will end up having cycles of resentment and blow-ups. Resentment and blow-ups with many partners and friends in the future. Am I the jerk for asking the men to clean up after Thanksgiving dinner? I'm 42, female. My husband is 37, male. We were invited to his sister's house for Thanksgiving. I love to cook and entertain, so I volunteered to make a lot of dishes. Other people brought food also. I cooked for two days straight, and today, the morning of Thanksgiving, I suggested to my husband that he should gather up all the men to clean the kitchen after the shared meal, since literally only the women were the ones who cooked and prepared everything. Divide and conquer, if you will. He agreed to do so. We had a great meal. After dinner, everyone sat around chatting with coffee and were having a good time. At some point, the men all transitioned to the living room to watch football while the women began helping my sister-in-law clean her kitchen. The kitchen connects to the living room, so it was evident what was going on. On the way home, I asked my husband what happened and why he didn't pitch in to help with the cleanup. He said I have a victim complex and I'm choosing to be in a bad mood. I told him I'm not in a bad mood, I'm just bringing up what was previously discussed and agreed upon and asked him if he thought it was fair. He then proceeded to tell me how there are certain jobs he has to do because he's a man. I said that's not the point here. I'm not talking about prior situations or arguments, just this evening in particular. Am I the jerk for thinking that all the people, in this case all of the men of the family, who contributed nothing to the meal, should have had a hand in helping clean it up afterwards? Not the jerk. If I acted like this, my wife would tell me to get takeout and eat by myself next year. Not the jerk. You had an agreement, he ignored it, and then tried to throw in your face other things he does. The audacity. Throw away the whole man. If that isn't an option, make it clear that he is in charge of both cooking and cleaning for Christmas and stick to it. If you keep allowing him to push you over, it's never going to change. Not the jerk. And I would die on this hill. I would never offer to help host a party that benefits him again. Anecdotally, my husband made everything for Thanksgiving because he loves to cook and he refused any offers of help. So I put all the leftovers away and cleaned up everything. It's only fair. I assume he was scared to tell the other men they needed to clean up because they are also jerks, so he conformed. Then he didn't want to admit to you that he was a scaredy cat and acted even more like a jerk. This is divorce worthy. He's making it clear to you that he has no respect for you and what you two agreed on. He would rather go with these other worthless men who want to watch football while you work hard to clean their mess. If my husband ever did anything like this, I would have gone in there and called him out in front of the other losers and made him come help clean. Fortunately, my husband did all of the cooking and cleaning on Thanksgiving while I watched movies with the kids. People need to realize that moms need breaks too sometimes. So he's a liar, he's ungrateful, and he's a jerk. Why would you ever cook for him again? Unpopular opinion, but I'm extremely jealous of the guys who lived 70 years ago. Even minimum wage back then was a salary they could support their entire family with. You could buy a house, even just working in fast food, and on the holidays, your wife wouldn't flip out on you if you didn't do enough cooking or cleaning. She just showed her love for the fact that you provided for the family by taking care of all that, and she enjoyed it because she appreciated you and wanted to show you that. I would give anything to go back in time to when things still made sense. It's baffling to me that men continue to behave like lazy bums and yet still have significant others. And then they have the nerve to argue. Of course you aren't the jerk. Your man-child husband is. This is precisely why I stopped participating in the family furnishment of these holidays. I, 52 female, work the same if not longer hours than the men in my family. They do not cook or help clean up. My 80-year-old mother still chooses to run around waiting on my father and brothers while they sit around watching TV, acting like captains of the universe. I'll be darned if this is how I'm going to spend a day off.
My new neighbor is demanding I change my dog's name. I, 36 male, am the owner of a great dog named Charlotte, who's 6. I live in a lower middle class suburb in an unspecified part of the US. I've lived here for about a year now and I let Charlotte out to use the bathroom about 5 or 6 times a day. It's always the same routine. I open the back door, Charlotte runs outside to go to the bathroom and patrol the yard and typically doesn't come back until I poke my head out and call out her name. About a week or two ago, new neighbors moved in across my back alley. I had no intentions of interacting with them whatsoever, except today when I was executing the last step of Charlotte's aforementioned potty protocol. I stuck my head out and called her name, but this time, alongside the familiar sounds of my dog galloping up, was an adult human voice shouting something along the lines of, Why are you calling my daughter? At first, I thought it might just be my new neighbors getting into a spat, until a couple of minutes later, I heard pounding on my front door. I opened the door to an angry woman glaring at me. She said something like, Why are you calling my daughter over? And I responded, Your daughter's name is Charlotte? And she just kept glaring at me. In absence of a response, I followed up with, Charlotte is my dog's name. And she rolled her eyes at me and said I better change my dog's name because she doesn't want her daughter, who's two, getting confused and running over to my house. I told her that's not going to happen because not only did my dog have the name first, we have also lived here first. Plus, I don't like strangers making demands of me before even attempting to be polite. She called me stupid and said that a human child obviously has priority over a dog for a name. I shut the door in her face and glared at her through the peephole for a moment before she eventually walked back to her house. Last potty break, I went out with Charlotte and stayed in the yard with her until she was finished. But the neighbor just kept staring at me with her arms crossed and glared at me the entire time. Not the jerk. You're not obligated to rename your dog. Continue with your usual routine. If their daughter were to come over, you just don't answer the door or you simply tell her to go back home. You can get a restraining order or file a report if that neighbor harasses and threatens you more. Not the jerk. This is one of the dumbest requests I've ever heard. Sorry to say, but these neighbors are going to be trouble. Just don't give in to their temptations to escalate a feud. Carry on with your business and try not to let them get under your skin. Am I the jerk for not following tradition on Thanksgiving? So to start this off, I, 27 female, have been dating my husband, 34 male, since 2018. We got married three years into our relationship, 2021, and things have been going extremely well. We've spent four years of Thanksgivings at my parents' house and this was the first time we chose to spend it at his parents' house. When we got there, my mother-in-law, her mother, and both my sister-in-laws were in the kitchen, all helping each other with the food. Me and my husband went in there and talked for a bit. My mother-in-law asked me if I would like to help out. I said, not right now. Would it be okay if I come back soon and help out a bit? She very nicely said it was totally fine and told me and my husband to get us something to drink and hang out with the men and the kids. My husband gave me a nasty look and said, you're not even going to help? His mother said that they were more than enough people and she just asked me in case I wanted to help with the cooking, but that they all managed just fine. He grabbed a beer for only himself and went into the living room. I did the same and followed after. I ended up helping them with setting everything up on the tables as I wanted to help out just a bit. His mother did not ask me to do this, neither did my sister-in-laws. Dinner went extremely well, we talked a lot and I really like his family. When we went back to the car, he started mumbling really angrily at me. I asked him about three times what he was saying before he blew up at me. He told me that it's their tradition that the women are in the kitchen cooking, that I disrespected his mom in her own house by acting so entitled. We ended up having an argument about this whole thing and he has not stopped insisting on that his mother in fact is offended by this. I have not talked to her about this, she did not tell me anything about being offended either. But I know his mom is a really nice woman who would never want to say anything bad about someone. So I'm starting to think that maybe I really disrespected her and she just doesn't have the heart to tell me. So am I the jerk for not following their traditions? I feel like I was the jerk because helping out would not have been that hard and had I known the outcome I would have just stayed and helped out. Edit, I don't know if this will help my case but I'm working as a nurse and had just come off an 18 hour shift and went directly to mother-in-law's house, hence why I was not that keen on helping out with dinner. I could not get the day off. Don't know if that is even relevant or not. It's just my reasoning behind this. Edit 2. I've seen many people thinking this and I've tried responding to the comments, but I did not completely ignore or disregard the female side of my in-laws. 
I was sat in the kitchen talking with them for most of the time, but I also went out to make small talk with the other people. Not the jerk. Oh, so now you're supposed to read your husband's mind? He's the jerk and you're not. And what are you supposed to read from his mind? That you're expected to obey outdated stereotypes? He's the jerk and you're not. It doesn't sound like you have kids yet, but if you do, I have a prediction. He will never change the diapers. Not the jerk. First of all, as a host, I would never ever ask a guest to help me. I'm hosting. If they offer, I may take them up on it, but asking a guest to help out, and especially not something quick like, oh, you're going to the living room? Could you take this plate of apps with you? That just feels tacky. And OP didn't even say she wouldn't help at all, just that she didn't want to immediately. Not the jerk. I really hope you don't already have kids with this deadbeat. He sounds like the horrible type of man who would want his sons to play competitive sports and for his daughters to learn how to do things like cooking. Modern science has proven that sports are bad for boys because it makes them more competitive, which can lead to aggression and feelings of superiority. We never allowed our son to play any sports and instead we taught him that he is not better or stronger than anyone. Instead of superhero shows, I encouraged him to watch My Little Pony because it's not violent like the Marvel shows. We are also making sure that our daughter does not learn how to cook because when she grows up, we don't want her to attract the outdated type of man who expects her to cook and clean. I'd much rather her marry a man who loves to cook, like my husband. My husband is a great father who knows his place and has never challenged me on how we choose to raise our kids. I'd honestly divorce this guy if I were you. There are still some good men out there like my husband, but they are not easy to find. Would you like to help means put on an apron and get in here. I know that, but if you didn't know that, that's okay. It was up to your husband to tell you right then and there, in front of his mother and sisters, that it was tradition for the women to bond over service to the family. Instead, he waited several hours to have a tantrum, like a kid, and acts like you embarrassed him. Please see the situation for what it really is. He thought he married a mind reader and is mad that you failed to know what was happening. He's the jerk. You're the jerk to them since it's their tradition. I'm not traditional, but I'd be a little upset if my husband didn't want to lend a helping hand for my uncles at a family gathering, if they had asked him to and he denied. I'd love the idea of helping family with no hesitation if I had nothing better to do. Even if I was tired, I would help and give a few minutes of my time while using up those few minutes to open up about my day or busy schedule and bond at the same time. Two birds with one stone. Then I'd tell them I need a break because of the long shift I had. Better luck next time. Now you know their tradition. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I'm still confused about that one commenter that said they don't allow her son to play sports. They don't want him to be competitive at all? It's like she thinks life's going to hand you everything you need and you're not going to have to compete for anything in life. Well, to be fair, that's how a lot of the Reddit people think the world should work. Am I the jerk for divorcing during my husband's mental health crisis? Me, 38 female, and my husband, 38 male. Married in 2009, and we have a daughter who's 11. Last three years have been really tough on us because of my husband's bad working conditions that started to affect his mental health. I noticed signs of burnout and depression and brought up these concerns regularly to him. He was very dismissive and refused to see a situation and refused therapy. He started becoming distant and often isolated himself and was regularly butting heads with our daughter. He eventually told me that he had met a woman at work. Their relationship was not, according to him, physical, but he was in love with her and felt that she was his soulmate and best friend. He said he was very sorry and that he could not decide which woman he would ultimately be happiest with. He spoke out about this at home whilst I was having the toughest time of my life. I cried alone over my dreams and plans, everything we had together. He also told me that in order to clear his head, he would need to leave the house and spend some time on his own. That coworker had offered him her spare room and he was going to take it. I asked for his help organizing the rest of the school year as I was commuting and I promised him that as soon as the school year was over, I would look for an apartment closer to my work and me and our daughter will move out and he can have the house to himself for his healing. <laughs> for his healing? The only healing this bozo needs is a kick in the pants. I found an apartment almost immediately and we moved. He would visit us one weekend a month and brought his chaos with him every time. The new home had become a safe haven that we cherished and he took it over as soon as he appeared and it felt like I wasn't breathing until he finally left. After six months of living like this, I decided I had given things enough time to mend and they had not. I was still hurt and bitter 
and he was still cagey about what was going on and what his ultimate decision really was. I told him I was done living like this and that I wanted a divorce. He absolutely lost it and left me and drove back to our old house in the middle of the night just to get away from me. A week later, he told me that coworker is pregnant and he was angry that I didn't want to even try to fix our marriage. Wait, coworker got pregnant with this bozo? What is wrong with people? Since then, he has gotten increasingly more hostile and accusatory in his communication with me. He blames me for breaking up the marriage and abandoning him during his crisis. He says he was not himself and has no idea why he did the things he did, but that I was the one who left. He claims I was no help when he needed me and that I had clearly mentally abandoned our relationship long before, more than three years prior. He tells me I'm cold and calculating and clearly not the person he thought I was. I understand that he's not well. He finally did go to therapy. I explained a lot of his actions with that in mind at first. So, am I the jerk? He claims I have become one, taking his daughter away and leaving. You took your daughter and yourself from an unstable living situation. Sure, maybe it would become stable tomorrow, but you gave it a lot of time. His mental health crisis may mean he's out of his mind, but either he's still responsible for his actions or he's not. If he is, you left him because of his actions. Seems reasonable. If he's not responsible for his actions, then you left him because he's deeply in crisis for an extended period and you can't continue to live that way or have your daughter live that way. I'm curious and concerned about your daughter's experience of this. Those are the people my heart goes out to the most, your daughter and your husband's new baby. Because everyone else, jerk or not, was some form of a volunteer for this. The kids get no choice but all of the consequences. But I don't think leaving your husband while he's in crisis is unacceptable, especially given the long duration and terrible experience for you of that crisis. Not the jerk. OP. Honestly, it's our daughter I'm mostly worried about in all of this. He clearly has changed a lot, no matter how much his mental health plays into it. He will no longer keep his opinions to himself when our daughter visits him, and honestly, I'm left to pick up the pieces when she comes back and slowly opens up about what her father has been saying during the visit. I'm really trying my best not to ever speak ill of him in front of her, and I basically keep my family in the dark because I don't want them to have an attitude towards him that could reflect on her. He seems to have no such issues as I'm slowly finding out. He chews me up in private conversations, which I can deal with, but he also says stuff like, after your mother kicked me out, I can't help you anymore. And all I want is to have our family back, to our daughter, and I feel that that's horribly unfair. He's really wallowing in misery right now, and I do have sympathy for him, but he's burdening his daughter and painting me as an absolute villain. He still hasn't told her about the new baby, and honestly, I'm a little at a loss on what to do about that. Update. The divorce is in process, and I have not seen him in person for some four months at this point. He mostly keeps radio silence until it seems he has to unload some hurt on me. I've kept our contact to a minimum, only ever messaging him in things regarding our daughter or requesting him to react to official paperwork or to his electricity bills that I've transferred to him. Due to circumstances in which we started the separation originally, I paid most of his living expenses, mainly since I have a steady job and I get paid double his salary. He's still very much incapacitated by his mental health issues and I wanted to alleviate some of the practical matters for him. Now that we are pulling everything apart, he has been, maybe purposefully, making this into a very slow and frustrating process. Currently, I still pay for his electricity and he reimburses those bills for me at the end of each month. Sometimes he needs encouraging. Usually this leads to him messaging me all day, usually complaining on how I'm now raising our daughter, now that I have made him obsolete, his words telling me to get a new dad to help with the job as soon as possible. He seems to try very hard to push my buttons by saying things like, it must be very hard for you to send your daughter to someone who you loathe and hate so much. And if I make the mistake of losing my temper, even for just one word, he will turn immediately and tells me to calm down, stop spitting acid, and maybe we should continue our discussion when I'm not so wound up. I have mainly chosen to not engage in these conversations if and when they start, I have all of his outbursts in writing. I'm also currently under the impression that the coworker is not interested in a relationship with him anymore. And all of those who asked, yes, the baby is his by his own word. He still has not told our daughter about any of it. I've chosen to give him an ultimatum on the matter. I will bring it up one more time when we have our official meeting with our child welfare officer next month. That's the official route where we live. And if he still refuses, I will take it to myself to tell our daughter the truth. So many of you have encouraged me to do this for her sake and for the sake of our relationship, 
and I thank you for sharing your experiences with me. I've also contacted her school therapist and the curator and informed them of the issues she's facing now and the ones still to come. I'm hoping they will offer her some scheduled help since I know that she's shy on telling me everything. She is the most important thing in my life and as sorry as I am for her having to go through this essentially because of my choices, I refuse to take all the blame now and I'm ready to shift it to where it belongs. Personally, I'm a much happier person these days. I feel bursts of gratefulness and true happiness these days just by watching her eat her dinner and talk to me about her day at school. Even my houseplants are thriving, as silly as it sounds. I finally opened up about all of this to some of my friends and my siblings and they've all been super supportive. And my siblings were clearly shocked, but both did bring up that they are somehow not surprised at how it went down. They seem to have seen things a bit more clearly from afar, just like this community did. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I feel like my daughter and I are going to be just fine in the end. I actually laughed out loud at the part where he told OP his affair partner was pregnant, but he can't believe OP doesn't want to fix the marriage in the same breath. Like, buddy, do you hear yourself? OP. Honestly, at that point, I had already made up my mind, and when I sat there and listened to his rant, I got the feeling that so much more was to come. When he finally told me about the pregnancy, I nearly laughed out loud myself. It was so absurd that it felt like the whole drama had been turned into a farce, like people would never believe me if I told them this story. And with that reaction, I realized that I was really mentally in a better place, one foot out the door and not ever going back. This was not my crap show to deal with anymore. Stop paying the electricity bill. Stop being sympathetic or empathetic with him. Do not engage. You need to do this for yourself. You owe that to yourself. OP. My friends have also told me to just drop the electricity contract for my plan and have him figure it out. Logically, I know it takes one call for him to make a new contract. He gives me excuses I know are false, but since I also know how passive his mental health issues have made him and how insurmountable small things can become, I find it so difficult to do this and go back on my word. There's also the fear how making our currently bad relationship even worse will inevitably reflect on our daughter and getting through all the legalities. I can't wait until it's all done and dusted. Update 2 I finally separated the rest of our finances, stopped paying his bills, and made official agreements on child support and custody, which remain shared for now as he went back on his word to give it to me uncontested. He did not agree to sign an official visitation agreement because he could not commit to it right now. I offered him every other weekend and half of all holidays. He has started to meet our daughter more often though, since nowadays she actually visits him on her own free will. It seems that their relationship has gotten a bit better lately, which I'm of course happy about. He has been absolutely terrible towards me though. He started a campaign of passive-aggressive texting after I asked him to be civil. Now every message is overly syrupy and filled with overflowing apologies. I ignored this until he decided to talk to me face-to-face -face when we went to sign the agreements. He told me his therapist told him to talk to me for closure and speak his mind, so he did. He once again just explained to me how hard this last year has been and how I tore the marriage apart. How he was not ready to accept this divorce and never will be. How nothing in his current life is what he wanted or asked for and considers it an insult if I congratulate him over the upcoming baby, etc. This felt really off considering he had just moved in with his affair partner. He originally tried to hide this too and was evasive, but of course our daughter found out the next time she visited and told me. I know it's pointless, but I felt I needed to say something too, so I told him that he completely continues to ignore all my pain and the mental work I had to do over this whole thing, and I can't help the fact that my love died in the process. He says I didn't even try. He said even my parents were more supportive of him because they had exchanged pleasantries having met briefly a few weeks prior. His coworkers were more supportive than me. I told him to look in the mirror and that his little passive-aggressive game was so obvious. Clearly it hit home because he stopped immediately after. He has also been snooping over my dating life through our daughter and is very jealous and gets very verbally aggressive over it. Now the thing that brought me back to you tonight is that despite my life having turned so much better in the last few months and my daughter and I being happier than we have in a long while, I fell into an unexpected hole today. He was supposed to have her over this weekend but ended up canceling. The reason he gave me was different than what he gave our daughter so I knew he lied to someone. Yesterday, he blew up on me over text that originally started as a discussion over our daughter's visit. He started the same old song of me being so petty over such a minor thing as his affair that was apparently not even a real affair at first. He wrote that my parents were right about me being too sensitive. 
He knows how low of a blow this is, since he's been supporting me through my issues with my parents and validating all of my gripes my whole life with, you are too sensitive. I told him how low that was and that he does not get to quantify my pain and he totally lost his marbles to the point where I had to stop reading his messages because I was afraid I would start to cry in the office. This morning our daughter runs to me crying happy tears and jumping of joy. Her father had sent her pictures of her newly born little sister. I congratulated the new official older sister and we gushed over the pictures a little. Throughout the day, my mood has just been awful. I've got messages from my family asking how I am because daughter of course told everyone, which is totally okay, but it's starting to weigh on me. I've been tired and easily irritated. All of a sudden, I felt like I had no one to talk to, no one who would really understand, someone unbiased, an adult to talk to. Those have been my hardest moments in all of this. I lost my best friend when we fell apart, and whenever I feel like I really need to open up and spill my heart, it reminds me of how alone I feel. Is this a normal reaction? I've been fine and very emotionally cut off from him for so long, and somehow the birth of this baby sent me into a sudden nosedive today. I felt like I needed to tell all of this in my lowest point in a long while. So, thank you for reading. This mental health crisis sounds like an awfully convenient excuse for a lot of bad choices. This poor woman, I hope she can find her peace. Am I the jerk for kicking my husband out of the house for repeatedly arguing in front of my family? Background. My husband and I are both argumentative people who have sort of tough personalities. I'm a lawyer and he's retired military. We argue frequently about facts or politics, but these are usually good-natured and humorous. But I try not to do this if we're socializing or at family events, since no one wants to watch another couple argue. Almost a year ago, we hosted two of my older relatives at our house for a few days. All was well until the topic of social media came up at dinner. I mentioned something about how Twitter was a toxic waste dump, full of hostility. My husband decides this is something to argue about and says that's not true. So we start arguing about it and he's getting angry. Our guests were clearly becoming uncomfortable and quiet. Eventually, he furiously says, This conversation is over. Gets up and abruptly leaves the room. I'm left in awkward silence and have to apologize to my relatives. After they left, I told him how upset I was, that he made us look like two psychos arguing over something so stupid, and that wasn't a normal way to act with guests. He apologized, said he wouldn't do it again, and admitted to me that Twitter was awful and didn't know why he even argued about it. Six months later, we were visiting with another relative and he did the same thing, about the same topic. I don't know how it came up, but he angrily argued until it was awkward and uncomfortable. After that, I was very upset. Once again, he apologized and promised me it wouldn't happen again. About a month ago, he told me on his own accord that he was thinking of deleting Twitter because it's such a cesspool. Then at Thanksgiving, hosted by my cousin yesterday, he does it again. We're sitting at the table having a pleasant conversation and my brother mentioned that after the initial argument where he stormed out of the room, it had concerned my older relative so much that she had told my family she was concerned for our marriage. So the Twitter topic came up and once again, he starts arguing about it in a hostile manner till the table was uncomfortable and quiet. Finally, I said, are you seriously going to gaslight me again on this topic? Did you not just tell me you were thinking of quitting Twitter because it's such a toxic waste dump? And he says, not in those exact words. I was furious he did this to me again and we didn't speak on the ride home or for the rest of the night. Today, he says nothing to me and doesn't bother to acknowledge it or apologize. I feel like I'm married to some big domineering gorilla that likes to make displays to show he's in charge and make everyone bow down to his foul moods. He doesn't even actually disagree or care about this topic, so I don't know why he does this. Finally, I boil over and tell him I want him to leave the house. Three strikes and you're out. He just asks, for how long? And I said, I don't know. He then stormed around angrily, got his stuff and left. Everyone sucks here because you feed into him by continuing the argument instead of just telling him you're not going to argue. But he's also crappy because he starts arguments over things that he thinks he should have an opinion about. You both sound insufferable and annoying. Everyone sucks here. He's in the wrong for starting these arguments, but you're in the wrong too for continuing them. One of you needed to accept the other's opinion and back down, yet neither of you did. Your husband seems to be worse though. I'll give you that. Last year, my girlfriend ghosted me. Yesterday, I found out why, and now I feel numb but grateful. At the end of September of 2022, my girlfriend ghosted me. She disappeared and blocked me on her phone and all of her social media accounts. I tried reaching out by email, but no response there. 
This past year has been melancholy. Every now and then I sent her an email telling her how much I missed her. Yesterday I ran into her sister that she used to live with and she told me what had happened. Around summer of last year, the sister's deadbeat boyfriend, no job, no money, no ambition, moved in with them and my girlfriend and the deadbeat started hooking up. Eventually she stole her sister's boyfriend and her family disowned her because of it. When she ghosted me, my now ex-girlfriend moved to another town with her new boyfriend where they now live together. Her sister told me that even though they don't talk anymore, the sister still follows my ex on social media. She explained that around March of this year, 2023, my ex placed a personal ad. The sister told me that in the ad, my ex described me, things I do, my career, place in life, ability to support her as her ideal partner. I asked if my ex broke up with her boyfriend and the sister told me they are engaged and living together. We hugged and I wished the sister a happy Thanksgiving. When I got home, I couldn't believe what I heard. As I thought about it, I realized that my ex was and still is monkey branching. Most of all, I wondered how she could do that to her own sister. I wondered if she was actually a closet narcissist. While we were together, she suffered from social anxiety, so I constantly reassured her and comforted her. Last night, I did some research about links between social anxiety and narcissism. In my research, I learned about covert narcissism, and my ex fits the symptoms and behaviors exactly. I realize now that I had been dating a covert narcissist. When I step back and think about it, I feel like I dodged a bullet. We talked about getting married, having kids, and raising a family. I can't imagine the train wreck I would have gotten into. I don't have any ill will against my ex, and I wish her the best. I do know that I don't want to see her ever again. I'm grateful that she's no longer in my life. Last night I couldn't sleep. I'm grieving now, but I know I'll be alright. I was married to a covert narcissist. The damage that he did to us was incredible. They literally take you apart and then declare war to ruin you if you leave. She did you a favor. My Karen neighbor demands I let her kids play in my yard even after they graffitied my house. My father bought the house in the 80s and held on to it as different developments sprung up around it. I inherited it three years ago and have been living in it since. I have two acres while my surrounding neighbors have maybe half an acre if they're lucky. The house is fairly small, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, so I have a very large front and backyard. I use maybe one-fifth of the backyard as a garden and the rest is basically an empty field. I've always loved kids, so I was happy to let my neighbor's kids play in the field with the understanding that they would respect the property. Most of the kids are great, very respectful and understand that this is not their yard. The problem is with my neighbors to the right. They have five kids, who are one, three, five, five, and seven, who generally run around unsupervised. They don't come to my yard to play very often unless the other kids are playing soccer or baseball. The seven-year-old is in charge, as much as a seven-year-old can be, but obviously he can't replace parental supervision. Five days ago, the kids were playing baseball and he must have lost track of the five-year-old at some point because when I came home from work, I found their names sharpied onto my wall, along with some rude drawings. I found their parents the next day and asked them to pay for the paint I'll need to cover it up. They were very offended, accused me of lying, and said they weren't going to pay. If this had been all, I probably would have let it slide and covered the paint since it would only be like $20. But later that day, one of their five-year-olds decided it would be funny to throw rocks at my house. There are several dents in the siding where the rocks hit and two of my windows are broken. From what I've been quoted to fix, it's about $800 to $900 worth of damage. I talked to the parents who accused me of doing it myself to make their kids look bad. I've decided those five are not allowed to use my yard until the damage is paid for, which I think is more than fair. When they came by this morning to play soccer with the other kids, I politely explained the situation and said they would have to leave as they aren't allowed to play here anymore. The seven-year-old was very upset, more sad than a temper tantrum, which is understandable, but the five-year-olds were both very angry. About an hour later, their mom came by and went off on me, yelling at my doorstep about how I'm a horrible person who can't stand kids because I'm bitter and can't find a husband. I'm standing my ground either way, but a few other parents came by and seemed a little frustrated by my explanation as to why that family is no longer welcome, which is making me question things. Am I the jerk for banning them from playing here? Edit, to answer some common concerns. I will be installing cameras. I dug my dad's old trail cams out of the garage, so I'll put those up either tonight or tomorrow. I am aware of the liability issues with kids playing in my yard. I'm willing to risk it. 
I don't want to put up a fence. I think they're ugly. The property line is clearly marked. I will not be banning the entire neighborhood unless I absolutely have to. Edit 2. I also have a meeting scheduled with my attorney to discuss the possibility of drawing up a liability waiver for the parents to sign. Forgot to put that in the last edit. They're also usually unsupervised. Typically, there's a parent or two hanging around anyway, and I work from home, so the kids know to knock on my door and ask me to watch them if their parents are busy. I'm also looking into an umbrella policy that would be more likely to cover any injuries that occur. You're the jerk. As a mother of six myself, our kids need a place to stay and have fun. You can't expect us to take them to the park every single day. Kids are supposed to run around the neighborhood and get in trouble. That's how I grew up, and believe it or not, I turned out just fine. If you live in a neighborhood with other people, like it or not, you're going to have kids running around, you know, being kids. Trust me, no parents like dealing with a grumpy old neighbor who complains about everything that their kids do. If it were up to people like you, my kids would be stuck inside 24-7, being quiet as a mouse. I've had neighbors complain before about just about everything. My kids screaming, leaving trash in their yards, my dogs barking too much, you name it. I tell them the same thing every time. Don't like having neighbors? How about you move out to the middle of nowhere where you belong, since you're unable to deal with living in an actual neighborhood? My kids have been playing outside all day, and the boomer neighbors are sitting on their deck right now. I already know they're going to be calling the HOA again like they always do. What they don't know is that I'm friends with the head of the HOA, and every time we talk, we laugh about him and his BS. Bottom line, if you can't stand living next door to a family, just go live somewhere rural where we won't have to deal with your complaining. Well, don't you sound like a pleasant neighbor. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you let them keep playing in your yard or not? Please let us know. I'd get a couple of big, mean, hungry dogs is what I'd do. Ruff. I called the police on my entitled son. For context, I, female 35, have a son that was born when I was married to my first husband. I was young when he was born and his father was horrible to me. My ex-husband's mom was constantly in our lives, trying to take over and make my son hers. I left my ex when I was in my early 20s and my ex-mother-in-law ended up taking my son into another state and filing for custody. She went to a state that has grandparents' rights, as ours didn't. I fought her for years and ended up getting remarried to my current spouse and we had a son together when I was in my mid-20s, a boy who is now 10. I see my oldest son only during the summer and the holidays. I finally got the court case moved to our local court and the judge says that I was wronged and ordered shared custody and visitation. My ex-mother-in-law made a huge deal that my son needed to stay with her during the week because of school and the judge went with it so he could finish high school in an environment where he was familiar. My ex-mother-in-law has ruined my son, just like she did her own. She's given him any and everything he's wanted, she's taught him no respect and kept him very sheltered. She literally jumps on people if they don't give him his way. So in turn, my son is loud, violent, and all around sad to be around. So he came up to visit during Halloween and he acted awful. My husband's mom lives with us and she isn't well. She's doing chemo. She's been a big help with my youngest son so that I could help my husband with our business. My youngest is a delight to be around. He's polite, funny, and respectful. We've taught him that you don't expect anything unless you work for it. I went and picked my oldest up and his attitude started right away because his phone died and the charger I had in the truck didn't fit his phone. He wanted me to get off the interstate and buy him an overpriced one from a truck stop or something. I told him no, I'd get him one when we got into town and that next time he needs to remember to bring one for the house and for the car. I suggested making a packing list ahead of time. Now my youngest was in the back with his tablet playing quietly and my oldest realized the tablet was plugged into a car charger. He asked his younger brother for the charger, and I told him it's an Apple charger. It won't work with your Android. My oldest said, You don't know that. Shut up. Next thing I know, he's forcibly taking the Apple charger and is trying to fit it into his phone. When it didn't work, he threw it into the back seat of the truck. My youngest just plugged his tablet back up without a word, but I told my oldest that his behavior wasn't acceptable. Fast forward to the next day. Older son is still fuming at me because I made him wait bad-mouthed me to his grandma, etc. I left to go to the office, as did my husband, and my mother-in-law was going to take my youngest son to the treat trail for Halloween. She asked other son if he wanted to go, and he told her to kick rocks. My husband told him not to speak to her like that. 
I knew trouble was brewing, I just didn't know how bad. Apparently, mother-in-law and younger son went to the treat trail and older son called mother-in-law to tell her he wanted Hardee's, also known as Carl's Jr. My mother-in-law told him there was food at home and that it would be a while before she could get in. Older son told her that she needed to bring it right now. My mother-in-law told him to either eat what was at the house or wait. He lost it on her and hung up on her. Mother-in-law called me and I told her not to reward his bad behavior. I told her we had plans to go out later to eat. He could wait. So when mother-in-law gets home, she tries to open the door and her key won't work. Older son comes to the door and tells her that he's angry and doesn't want her in the house, so he locked her out. He told her to wait outside until he either felt like opening the door or until I came home. My mother-in-law told him to open the door ASAP. She called me crying and I went off. I called older son and told him he didn't make the rules in my house. He went by them and that he would be punished if he didn't open the door. He really thought I was playing. I left the office and went home. Cue disaster. I opened the door and older son was there on the other side. Mother-in-law and younger son had been waiting in her car and older son was blocking threshold, saying that he had told mother-in-law to keep outside, that it was her punishment for telling him no. I told him to move now. I tried to push past him and he pushed me back outside, threatening to lock us all out. I went to go inside again and he put his hand in my face and pushed me back out. I told him, that's it, I'm calling the police. He didn't think I was serious, but I did it. I told the dispatcher that my older son was refusing to let me into my own home and had put his hands on me. Older son goes into a rage, and I mean a pure rage. He comes out of the door, screaming and threatening, tries to take my phone, and the lady tells me she'll send someone ASAP. I mean, I had to literally fight him to keep him from breaking my phone. Then he goes after my younger son and starts saying horrible things to him. My mother-in-law locks herself and my younger son in the car as my older son proceeds to kick and punch the car. He even cracked the windows in the window shield. Older son goes after mother-in-law just as my husband pulls up. He's telling mother-in-law this is her fault, that she just needed to do what he said. My husband tries to restrain older son and older son is screaming that he will have my husband arrested, etc. The police came and they immediately restrain older son and put him into the back of the van. My husband and I explained the situation and I told the officer that my ex-mother-in-law had shared custody. So the officer calls ex-mother-in-law and tells her what's happening. He puts her on speaker and she immediately puts the blame on us, saying we provoked him and we were mistreating him. The officer told her that didn't seem to be the case as a neighbor had come forward and said she had called 911 also, plus had a security camera that showed the entire thing. Ex-mother-in-law jumps to saying the police here can't do anything with older son as he's a resident of another state, blah blah blah. The cop tells ex-mother-in-law that's not the case and it seems like older son needs to learn his lesson. The officer hangs up and ex-mother-in-law immediately calls me. I put her on speakerphone. She's not the smartest, yet thinks she is. If I had older son arrested, that I would be a bad mom and that he was justified in what he had said and done. I asked her about the true son thing and she said he was my only heir, as he was my first son, and from my first marriage, and divorce is a sin. I told her that's not how it works. I told her I'm tired of him taking my home over and trying to hurt others. Long story short, he spent three days in jail before a hearing, and the judge asked me what I wanted to do. So older son is being sent to a group home. My ex-mother-in-law fought the entire way, but had no hold, because both officers and my neighbor gave statements. Now ex-mother-in-law is saying I'm ruining his life and I'm a bad parent. She's also accusing my husband of mistreating him. Okay, so I've noticed a lot of comments saying I abandoned my son, gave him to his paternal grandma, etc. That's not the case. I live in a commonwealth state with no grandparents' rights and she had 25 plus years of residency in a state that does have them. When I left her son, my ex-husband, she became furious. In her home state, a grandparent has the right to intervene in the child's life during the parent's divorce, and she used that to her advantage. A judge in her home state granted her visitation with my son, even though he was born in my state. During a visit, she filed for custody and was granted it until the divorce was finalized. The divorce took over two years due to my ex not wanting to sign papers and being difficult, so older son was almost 10 when it was finalized. I got something called a change of venue accepted, and the custody case was transferred to my local court, where it should have been there the entire time. Of course, ex-mother-in-law wasn't going to willingly hand him over, so she kept filing appeals. 
continuances, and other things to prolong the case. It eventually went from family court to circuit court, which is also known as high court for that judge to decide. By this time, older son was at the legal age where he could have a voice in court and was established at school in ex-mother-in-law's area. The judge said that he could finish school there and then be transferred up here for school. My ex-husband had signed his parental rights over to his mom and the judge had to take that into consideration. He did this to avoid the state going after him for support. The local judge ordered ex-mother-in-law to do therapy as well as older son and there were issues with them not complying. My ex-mother-in-law ruined her own son, he's in his 30s, won't work, doesn't drive, and expects her to keep him up. I did nothing wrong aside from leaving my horrible ex-husband. The recent psych evaluation said older son lacks empathy for others and has delusions of grandeur, meaning he thinks he's better than others. Ex-mother-in-law also had to do a session and the therapist said ex-mother-in-law is similar in regards and that her expectations aren't realistic. They both have superiority complexes. My ex-mother-in-law used to lock me out of my own home because she wanted to punish me or limit my contact with my own son. When she took him, I did contact local and state police, but they couldn't go into her state without the permission of officials there, and by then she had filed paperwork. She had nothing to use against me, would not abide by court-set visitation, etc. I have two homes, a business, and I'm very self-sufficient. My family life is good, not dysfunctional. We've done everything we can to incorporate my son into our family, but he's refused to accept us. I'm sorry I was a crappy mom for not allowing him to lock me out of my own darn house. Holy cow, you did the right thing. Your son is a threat to everyone in your house and his grandmother is doing him no favors. Get him the help he needs. Don't abandon him, but don't risk your family's safety. My wife's sister tried to kiss me and now my wife is spiraling. Plus final update. My wife's sister made a pass at me at a recent family gathering and I have no idea what to do. For context, I think my wife, Jenna, is absolutely gorgeous, but she has some really negative body image issues. This is in large part because of her sister, Mary, who is very conventionally attractive as opposed to Jenna's more unconventional, but in my opinion, striking beauty. Mary was a successful model until a couple of years ago and now she works in the fashion industry. In our early days of dating, when I would tell Jenna she's beautiful, she would always say, just wait until you see my sister. When I did finally meet her family, she would randomly press me for weeks to talk about her sister, whether I thought she was more attractive than her, etc. I always told her the truth, that I think Mary is attractive in a boring way, and that I think my wife is much more beautiful and interesting to look at. She wouldn't let it go until I confronted her about how uncomfortable it made me, and I asked her what was going on. This is when she told me that she always had a chip on her shoulder about her looks, because of being compared with her sister growing up. They fell into the classic smart one, pretty one dynamic their whole lives. She also said Mary had a habit of being flirty with all of her exes and warned me that it would happen to me eventually. She then started sobbing and begging me to not cheat on her with her sister, to which I forcefully said I would never cheat on her with anyone, let alone her sister. I've been crazy about my wife since day one and there's literally no woman on earth who could come close to her. I honestly didn't believe her about the flirting at first, I assumed it was just an extension of her insecurity, but I was wrong. Whenever we get together with my wife's family, Mary always finds ways to make little comments about me. It's super uncomfortable for everyone, especially my wife, and I've called her out on this before. She'll cool it for a while, but eventually starts doing it again. It's been six years of this, and every time it happens, my wife is upset for days, and I have to do a lot of reassuring. On to the current problem. A few days ago, we were at my mother-in-law's birthday party and Mary asked me to help her grab some things from the garage. As soon as we walked into the garage, she turned and started trying to kiss me. I immediately pushed her off and asked her what the heck she was doing. She started giggling and saying she was just doing what we both have been thinking and kept insisting, you know you want to. I told her she was out of her mind and I ran out of there. I went straight to my wife and told her we were leaving. The whole ride home, she was asking me what was wrong. I wasn't sure whether to tell her because I knew how much it was going to hurt her, but I also thought Mary would probably try to spin it as me making a move on her, so I knew I had to just say it. I told her everything and she cried the whole way home. For the last several days, Mary has been calling and texting my wife, doing exactly what I thought she would do, even telling my wife that I said she, Mary, was the hottest girl I've ever seen which I had to assure my wife a million times that I did not say that and I never would. 
even though she believes my account of the situation. She's been a complete wreck the last several days. She's hardly eating. She pulls away from my touch when I try to hug her or just hold her. She says that she feels hideous and disgusting, and I don't know what to do. This is the lowest that I've ever seen her, and it hurts to see how much she's hurting. I have no idea what to do to help her heal from this. Reddit, what should I do? All family gatherings that include Mary must now be non-attendable. Your wife knows what an awful person her sister is, and hopefully the rest of the family does too. To be honest, your wife's sister is evil. You have reassured your wife of your love and faithfulness. Your wife is incredibly insecure about herself, so obviously a professional may be in order for her and for you too. You love your wife, so stand by her and be there to support her. OP. My in-laws definitely enable her behavior. She's the golden child. They brag about her constantly, even though my wife is a neuroscientist. Their mom was a pageant queen, and she was their dad's much younger trophy wife. Honestly, we may have to go no contact with all of them. Update. Several people have asked how my wife's family feels about all of this, and I explained in a comment that her parents are toxic and treat Mary as the golden child. Even though my wife is a neuroscientist, amazingly talented musician, speaks three languages fluently and another two conversationally. My wife and her family are seriously the only people who don't seem to understand how exceptional she is. I remember meeting one of my wife's family friends and talking to them about her research, and they said, Oh, wow, her parents just told us that she works at a university, whereas my parents literally introduce her as the family genius to everyone. It makes me so angry to think about how her family has stolen her shine her whole life. She's literally a renaissance woman, but all they care about is looks and money. Some people asked me why I would ever put myself in a situation alone with Mary given everything she's done. I have no good answers for that other than I never thought she would actually try to do anything like this. That possibility just didn't even exist in my head. I realize now that I should have seen this would happen eventually and that I should have been less concerned with keeping the peace and more concerned with shutting Mary's crap down before it escalated to this point. Hindsight is 2020. Anyway, on to the update. The night I posted, I told my wife that if she wanted to try to repair her relationship with her sister, I would respect that, but that I don't feel comfortable with being around her for the foreseeable future. I said Mary has obviously been deeply jealous of my wife her whole life because she is a hollow, ugly person whose entire value has an expiration date, while my wife actually has substance. I said that I think her whole family is toxic and has done nothing but put her down her entire life, but that only she can decide where she wants them in her life or not. I also told my wife that while I don't blame her for her emotional reaction, her insecurity is something that she needs to work on for our relationship to be healthy. What Mary did was wrong and she's been acting this way for years, but I have consistently put aside my own feelings about this problem because of how it affects her and that has prevented me from getting the support that I need too. I told her that her reaction only serves to punish herself and me for her sister's behavior and there's no reason to give her that kind of power. I also told her something that a commenter said that really resonated with me. The only people who have ever considered her second best are her and her family. Everyone else sees her for who she really is. She was crying the whole time and agreed that she needed to go to therapy to work on her insecurity. We were able to find a therapist who specializes in body image and self-esteem issues to work with her individually and we're looking for a couples therapist too. My wife sent a message to her parents and sister that explained exactly what happened and told them she would reach out to them if she ever feels ready to repair their relationship. We blocked all of them everywhere, but Mary has of course been spamming my family and our friends with nonsense that thankfully nobody believes. My wife is still down in the dumps, but I can see that things are getting a little better. She's eating and sleeping more, and she's cuddling with me in the mornings again, which is nice. Now I'm planning a surprise getaway for us this weekend. We're going to one of our favorite places and I'm going to wine and dine her and try to make her feel like the queen that she is. I want to thank you all for your help. You really helped me understand this. Y'all are the best. Update. My wife loved the getaway weekend. We had a blast and by the end of it, she said she felt like herself again. For a few days after we got back, things were really quiet, so we were hopeful that Mary had finally given up, but I felt uneasy about it. Many of you warned me that Mary would try to interfere with my work and while I initially dismissed it, I figured I would reach out to my boss just in case. I've been working at the same company for almost 10 years, and she's heard me vent about Mary, so I didn't have to explain too much. My boss just reassured me that she knows my real character and would let me know if Mary tried anything. As you predicted, Mary did try to contact my boss a couple of days later, 
and the following is a recounting of what my boss told me. Apparently, Mary said that I needed to be fired because I was a creep and everything that happened was my fault. My boss said that was a very serious accusation to make and asked Mary to explain what proof she had. Mary claimed there was a video camera footage of the whole incident and my boss asked her to send the video. Then Mary got flustered and said the police had it, so my boss asked her to send over a copy of the police report. Then Mary said it had a lot of private information in it, so my boss asked her to redact the private info and send it over. Then Mary said she didn't feel comfortable with that and my boss told her that she could not take action against an employee based on word of mouth from a stranger. Then Mary shouted at her about victim blaming and hung up. Unfortunately, that was not the end of it. Last Wednesday, Mary somehow sent an email from my personal email account with a gross picture, not me, to the entire office. My best guess is that I must have left my email logged in on one of my in-law's devices. She's definitely not smart enough to actually hack me. At this point, it was clear we had to escalate things legally. I really wanted to avoid it, but she forced my hand. My wife and I have a lawyer friend who helped us draft a cease and desist letter outlining her continued harassment and the material and emotional damage this is causing us. My wife then sent a message to Mary and my in-laws with a copy of the letter and made it very clear that we would pursue criminal and or civil proceedings if her harassment continued. My wife's mom then called her crying and begged her to just let it go and leave Mary alone. My wife calmly explained that Mary is the only person responsible for this whole situation and that their parents have always enabled her awful behavior. She also said something she later regretted, but I think was pretty mean. Mary is going to stick you two in a nursing home and steal your money the minute she has the chance and you deserve it. After the way her mom reacted, my wife is firmly settled on cutting them off completely. This happened on Friday and on Sunday, Mary's best frenemy, Anne, sent my brother a message on Facebook to say Mary is going to leave us alone and to please not sue her. I told my brother not to respond, then just sat and enjoyed the idea that Mary was out there somewhere freaking out about the potential of having to actually face the consequences of her actions. It must be such a strange feeling for her. Since then, we haven't heard a peep from the grapevine. It feels like things are finally starting to go back to normal. My wife is starting therapy next week and will be starting couples therapy in a month or two. She wants to do some work on herself first. She's also taking a short leave from work to rest and recharge. I'm so proud of her for standing up for herself with her family and finally putting her mental health and well-being first. Final update. Mary and my in-laws have pretty much left us alone. My mother-in-law still tries to contact my wife every now and then, but she's made it clear to her family that if the first words out of their mouths aren't, I'm sorry, she isn't interested in the conversation. As you can see, the past six months have made my wife learn to stand up for herself. She has done some amazing work in therapy and her confidence is growing all the time. It's not just with her family, she's more comfortable asserting herself at work, with strangers, with friends, etc. She's even stopped putting up with some of my crap. To be fair, that crap is stuff like me leaving my socks everywhere around the house, but I'm seriously proud of her for telling me to cut it out. I'm becoming a more responsible and supportive partner because she's able to communicate her needs and expectations without feeling guilty about it, and I'm able to communicate things to her without intense emotions fully eclipsing the conversation. I didn't mention this in my earlier posts, but my wife does struggle with rejection sensitivity even outside of her family. Often, if I brought up something that I felt needed to change, her emotional reaction to feeling like she did something wrong would be really intense, and instead of dealing with the problem, it would become about regulating her emotions. Now my wife has really good coping tools that allow her to talk about the problem without thinking she is the problem. And the biggest update? She's pregnant. We have a baby girl due in February. I'm so excited. We're going to love her so much and teach her that she is more than her beauty. She's going to have happy parents who love each other and work through issues as a team. The toxic cycle will be broken. Jenna's family doesn't know and she's not sure if or when she'll tell them. But if she does, there are going to be strong boundaries in place for how they can be a part of our daughter's life, and it'll start with family therapy. For now, she has one set of grandparents that will go to the end of the earth for her, and that's more than enough. My family has been absolutely incredible in their support, and they are so excited for us. Things are looking better than they ever have before. Am I the jerk for divorcing my pregnant wife because she looked into my phone? My wife started jokingly making snide comments that I was having an affair. I thought she was teasing me, so I mostly ignored her or laughed with her. I didn't know she was actually serious. Then she was getting more irritated and arguments increased. 
In one argument, I asked her what her problem was, and she told me that I'm cheating. She started telling me all the time I was late from work, or how I was staring at a woman in the park, etc. I tried to explain everything and resolve her doubts. I even offered her therapy to clear her doubts. Then she started demanding to see my cell phone. I was like, nope, I don't have to do it. I never asked to see her phone, by the way. She told me if I have nothing to hide, I should do it. I told her she should just trust me, and I should not have to give proof of my honesty to her. But she would not let it go, so I unlocked it and told her, if she looks into my phone, we are done. She checked my phone, and I just went numb. Of course, she didn't find anything. I never cheated, and I don't plan to ever cheat. I told her I will move out, and we can figure out the rest. She freaked out and tried to apologize, but there is no going back. Now she's blaming it on pregnancy hormones, saying she was having dreams that I was cheating. I understand that, but she should have trusted me. I don't have to provide proof. It should be implicit, otherwise, why marry me? If she was having bad thoughts, we could have just talked it out, gone to therapy. She should not have put me in this position. It's very insulting that my own wife needs proof of my fidelity. That she thinks that I'm some kind of a person who would cheat on his wife, pregnant wife on top of that. She called her parents and they called mine and they're all trying to make me forgive her. I've made up my mind. She crossed the line. It's over. I just feel sad. I had planned a lot of things. I had spent countless hours baby-proofing my house. I just wanted a happy family for myself and it's all gone. Now I have to figure out how to be a single parent. My phone is buzzing all day. I've stopped replying to texts and receiving calls. I do think I have a right to be trusted in my own marriage without having to give proof every step of the way. Edit. I largely work from home. I did not spend lots of time away from her. I have to go to work two days a week. Notice how it's my house. I bought the house we live in before I met my wife, but it's currently our home. Yeah, this guy is looking to get out. When you tell your kid, mommy and daddy got divorced because she looked at my phone, do you think that will sound like a reasonable reason as to why you are not an everyday aspect of this kid's life? Dude here who had a pregnant wife recently. The hormones are real. It's not something we're capable of understanding the full extent of, but they're very real and very per person. My wife thought I was cheating too, even though she always knew I had zero time to. A female client who was very bubbly sent a few texts and it worsened her suspicion. When they gain the weight, they feel more insecure and it compounds it. From dude to dude, you're the jerk. But chalk it up to ignorance and being a dumb naive dude who, thankfully, won't ever understand what it's like to have your body create chemicals that alter every part of your body, brain included. Well, I knew a woman who, every time she was pregnant, became super suspicious and antagonistic towards her husband. She came and stayed with us for a couple of weeks. She seemed rational and lucid, but after every pregnancy, she went back to her normal self. She would just go crazy from hormones. I'm not minimizing the hurt you feel, but she literally may not be in her right mind, and so some grace might be in order. Not the jerk. You have every right to divorce her over this. If the man was the one looking through his wife's phone, everyone would be telling her that he's too jealous, insecure, and controlling, and she needs to divorce him. It's not okay for her to do this, no matter how much people want to justify it. You never have to stay with someone who doesn't trust you and violates your privacy like this, pregnant or not. Leave her, and hopefully she will learn to respect her future partner's privacy and stop with the massive red flags. This isn't the 50s anymore, and divorce exists for reasons exactly like this. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. If Reddit boy ever asked to see my phone, I'd be like, sure, here you go. And when you're done, check out those pictures of the spider that I took this morning. My recently engaged friend implied that I wasn't engaged because my boyfriend doesn't actually want to get married. My friend, Elise, 29 female, is engaged to Rick, who's 32, and I, 29 female, am dating Luke, who's 31 male. Elise and Rick have been engaged for a year, together for two, and I've been with Luke for three years. Fake names. So Elise and Rick had their engagement party Sunday afternoon. I was chatting with Elise, looking at her ring, and I'm not gonna lie, I felt a bit of envy. Luke and I have talked about marriage, but we haven't even looked at rings yet. He says he wants to marry me though, but I do think it's taking a long time. So I asked Elise what made Rick propose to her, like how it happened. She told me on their first date, she told him that he had a deadline. I asked what she meant, and she said that she told Rick she wasn't going to wait around two, three, four, or five years for a man, any man, not him in particular, to marry her. She said she wants kids with the right guy, 
but didn't want to have kids without a stable marriage and a house. Well, they have the house, and now they're getting married. Another one of her friends, don't know her age, but I'll call her Heidi, said she was shocked it didn't make Rick run for the hills. Elise laughed and said, Well, it wasn't an ultimatum, it was a fact. If after two years, you still can't tell I'm the one, then I'm clearly not, and I'll be moving on, period. I told Elise that if I told Luke that, he would leave me. That's when Elise said Luke probably isn't the right one if after three years he'd leave me for expecting marriage. That hurt my feelings, so I told her that marriages don't always last and it doesn't mean someone is the one just because they propose. She said she wasn't worried, that she and Rick were in love and knew life wouldn't be easy, but she's prepared to make it work. She also said she knows marriage isn't for everyone, which is fine, so long as your partner feels the same but that marriage is a value of hers and she wasn't going to waste time with someone who so clearly didn't have the same values as her. That's when Heidi asked me what my problem was. I told her I didn't have a problem, just stating a fact. Then Heidi asked how long I had been with Luke. I said three years and she asked if I wanted to get married. I said yes and when she asked what about Luke, I just excused myself to the restroom. Not much else happened at the party, but when Luke and I left, I told him about the conversation. Luke laughed and called Elise ridiculous. I asked what he meant, and he said, verbatim, only desperate and crazy women have a policy like that. Let it happen when it feels right. So I asked him if he wanted to marry me, to which he said of course. And I asked, then why aren't we engaged? We've been together longer than they have. He said he wasn't ready yet, and our relationship was fine the way it was. I asked how long did he have to wait to know, and he shrugged and said, does it matter? We're together, and that's what's important. The conversation paused for a minute and then Luke asked me to not be like Elise. He said that he doesn't like being forced to do something. I asked him if Rick felt that way. He's good friends with Rick. He admitted that Rick never said he felt forced and that he had been planning to propose to Elise six months after they met, but waited a bit to make sure he wasn't just jumping into something. I asked Luke if it would be okay for me to look at rings. He said I could, but to not get my heart set on anything because he wasn't ready and he said even if he was, he wasn't willing to spend more than $1,500 on an engagement ring. Elise ring obviously cost more than that. I never asked her how much it was, but center diamond is two carats, and the rest of the band is covered in diamonds. I remember she was asked once how much it was. She wouldn't answer, but said that Rick bought a ring he wanted her to love and did not care about the price. He found the ring she had liked, looked at the price, and saved money to purchase it debt-free. I didn't mention that to Luke, but her telling me that came back when Luke said he was only willing to spend $1,500 on a ring I'm not even allowed to really look for. Only $1,500 on a ring? Uh, is that not a lot of money to you? <laughs> I'm not really sure why, but the conversation with Luke and Elise has made me very sad. I'm slightly angry at Elise for her implications, but mostly I'm disappointed in Luke based on our conversation Sunday. He hasn't mentioned it since this weekend, but it's all I can think about. Did Elise go about it the right way? Is Luke wasting my time? I don't know. Both of those conversations Sunday have me feeling like something is off. Update. Elise and Rick will have been together three and a half years by the time they get married. I also think I gave the wrong impression of their relationship. Elise didn't demand a proposal from Rick and she was surprised when it came. They honestly sound like they just had a whirlwind of romance. She also didn't say she had to be married by the end of two years but that you should know if you want to marry her by the end of two years and be ready to be engaged so long as financially, work-wise, and in personal life, everything's okay. They were together for a year and a couple months before he proposed. He did not propose at six months. He told Luke he knew she was the one at six months and started looking for rings then, but they got engaged later than that. Also, I don't care how much Elise ring costs or how big it is. I didn't include that part because I was being petty. I was annoyed because Luke basically told me I don't get his say in what I'd be wearing. He developed the budget on his own without talking to me about it, and he knows next to nothing about jewelry and has never even asked me what I like. I always thought he'd do what Rick and other mutual friends did, which is look together, develop the budget together, and then pick what he thinks I would like. Rick didn't have the money for Elise's ring, his own words, so he made a financially sound decision to save up for a ring he knew she'd like but wouldn't break their bank either. I figured Luke was going to do the same thing, but apparently he had no intentions of doing so. Lastly, someone mentioned that Rick doesn't have as much going on as Luke does, which isn't true. I don't know what Rick actually does, but he works for a major company in the financial department. He's not an accountant, but he basically supervises all the money coming and going, sort of like a treasurer. Elise is a school guidance counselor, 
so both are very educated. No kids outside of their relationship. They're doing okay. Anyway, with me and Luke, he is very much go with the flow. More than I thought, actually. The reason I didn't reply to my first thread is because I decided to talk to Luke first. Long story short, we broke up. Several comments said I needed to communicate what I wanted clearly to Luke, so I took an hour to write out what I really wanted in the next couple of years and then told Luke the night I posted the first thread. I told him that after three years, we should be seriously considering the next step. I told him I wanted kids, and with my age, I'm scared of health problems and complications, especially with lockdown overtaking the hospitals around us. I told him that before we buy a house, we were looking, that I want at least to be engaged like Rick and Elise were. That's not a comparison per se, but I reflected on this and I think buying a house with a boyfriend who can't tell me when he wants to be engaged isn't very smart. Elise and Rick were engaged when they bought their house, so were several of our married friends, and I realized that's the minimum stage in a relationship I want to be in before purchasing a home. Luke's reaction was not pleasant. He told me he felt like I was trapping him in a corner and demanding a ring when I wasn't. I told him I wanted a plan and to see if we were on the same page, but I wasn't expecting a ring tomorrow or anything, just over the next year or so. He told me he'll propose when he's ready and me bringing it up over and over again is making him not want to do it because he thinks I just want a ring, but I don't. I want a family, but I don't want to be one of those women who has a kid with a man who doesn't actually want the same things I do. I told him that he doesn't seem like he wants to get married and that's when he said it. Luke told me he wants to get married but admitted he didn't know anymore if he wanted to marry me particularly. When I asked why, he said he doesn't think I have enough ambition. Luke wants to get a promotion at his job. He works in marketing. He's going to school for his master's and he's into self-improvement like going to the gym and eating healthier and mental health books. He said he felt I just wanted a marriage and kids and then I would be a stay-at-home mom, which he doesn't want me to do. He wants me to work, but I work as a secretary for psychology service. Luke makes almost three times as much as I do and I don't want to go back to school. I hated it the first time and I can't afford to do it again even if I wanted to. Plus, I love my job. Great pay, great benefits, and my bosses and coworkers are really cool. But he told me that was an excuse and he doesn't want to be tied to someone who is, as he said, okay with just being okay and that he wants more than that out of life. I was angry because I feel like I've asked this of him before and he always said he wants to marry me. I did tell him before I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom if financially we could afford it and I guess he didn't want me to. So I told him I was done with the conversation and he's been staying at a friend's house. I messaged him a couple of times to try and talk to him since, but he only responds saying he thinks we're on different pages and the relationship needs to be done so we can find what we want. I'm really sad and upset and feel like I wasted my time and that Elise was right. Luke took our relationship status off of Facebook and a ton of people have been asking what happened. His responses to my text messages also just seem so cold. From what I've heard from mutual friends, he sounds like he's doing okay and went out Friday night, New Year's Eve, with some of his friends to a bar. No, I have not talked to Elise, though she did reach out, but that's what happened. I was the first one to get married out of my friends and my husband's friends. We hadn't been together very long relative to our friends' relationships. Soon after our wedding, half of them were engaged, half were broken up. I think weddings can really make people think about their lives and their futures and see what it is they really want instead of just floating along and not discussing things. One of my biggest regrets is staying with someone I assumed would eventually catch up with me on marriage. The fact that she knew her boyfriend was not going to react well to that and would break up but thought her friend was wrong to voice what she wanted was sad and what her ex said about her, oof, he should have broken up with her before. Also, I think her friend was pretty smart for saying exactly what she expected on her first date. This is a good way to find out if the person you're looking to date wants the same things as you, and she was right. Hope OP learns that she can ask for a timeline when it comes to relationships. OP sounds absolutely unbearable. I know it paints a picture that she is the victim of him not knowing what he wants, but it sounds like he was just fine and just waiting for the right moment, exploring the relationship and building his life, while she sat and pined after a ring and to be provided for while she stayed at home and did nothing. They obviously have different values at the point of confrontation, but that isn't on him to forecast where things will go. I don't know, my partner and I have an atypical dynamic, so maybe I just don't get the whining because boyfriend didn't do exactly what the friends do, so therefore he's bad and the relationship is bad, and now it's time to prod him into making a decision when in three years an explicit description, OP knows he likes to let his heart lead and not be given ultimatums. Mess around and find out. 
surprised at everyone blaming the guy here. Sounds to me that they never had the conversation, but because the guy doesn't want marriage and the girl does, that he's automatically the jerk? As for 1500 bucks, that should be more than ample for any ring. If my wife was looking at rings worth that much, it would be a red flag to me. Hers cost around $400. There's nothing wrong with wanting different things. Doesn't make the guy the one in the wrong then. Sounds to me he thought all was sweet and got blindsided. This is something that should have been talked about years ago to make sure both were on the same page. I'm a big believer of the two-year rule. If you can't decide by that time if you want to be with someone, then you're wasting your years. I hear about relationships that last 5, 7, 10 years only to break up. Then you have two people in their late 30s or early 40s when the best years have passed, and especially a woman's most fertile years. Sure, there's no way of knowing if a marriage will last, but at least you tried it. You didn't stay trapped in a relationship for the better part of your adult life. I just hope she isn't angry with Elise. She opened her eyes. Poor OP. I spent three years with a guy who made me believe he would propose at some point and never did. Eventually, we broke up because he realized he didn't want kids at all. But it wasn't too long after I found someone who was ridiculously compatible with me and who wanted the exact same things and had the same values as me. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her ex-boyfriend? Please let us know. We all have our ideal lives that we want, and sometimes it doesn't align with the person we're dating. It's okay to call it quits and find someone who wants the same things that you do. Especially when it's going to save your future self a fortune by preventing an unnecessary divorce. My Karen sister volunteers me to babysit my neighbor's kids. I, 22 female, have a sister who's 26 who's going away this weekend with her husband who's 40 for a little getaway, which will be their first time since having their son, who's one. So my sister came over to visit today and she brought my nephew. She was going to be here for about two hours or so and my sister saw my next door neighbors. My sister spoke to my neighbor and said that she and her husband are going away for the weekend so my nephew is going to be staying here with me for the weekend and it's his first time without his parents. My neighbor, who has three kids and a husband herself, mentioned she's also going away this weekend as she's going to see a friend and she's looking for a babysitter also. My sister actually told my neighbor that her kids could come stay next door with me since I'm already babysitting my nephew. Here's the thing, my neighbor's husband will be home and he has the weekend off and they're his kids. When I found out my sister said the neighbor's kids were coming over, I said they were not. I only agreed to babysit my nephew. My sister thinks I'm being harsh and selfish and she thinks because I'm child free, that's why I'm being so rude about not wanting to babysit my next door neighbor's kids. However, if next door asked me, it would still be a no because the dad will be home and he can watch them. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. The nerve of your sister. I would have told her to go tell the neighbor the answer is no immediately or I would hand her kid back to her and not ever offer to babysit again. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.